I call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. First order of business 2.02 .02, certification of closed session. Can I have a motion, please? Uh, I certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, discussed only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law and that only such public matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you, Mrs. Hummel. Is there a second? Is there any discussion? Ms. Serza? Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Serza, could you take the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Ms. Ownby. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Thank you. Can I get a motion for approval of the agenda? Mr. Chair, I move approval of the agenda as presented. Is there a second? I second. Is there any discussion? Ms. Serza? Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Thank you. 4.01, announcement superintendent's report. Dr. Herring. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. The College of William and Mary Education Department, through the Dean's Award for Clinical Partnerships, recognizes educators who contribute to the professional pre preparation of William and Mary students through field-based experiences. Each year, Matthew Whaley Elementary School hosts many elementary education and special education students. They also host William and Mary students who are pursuing the ESL endorsement during the summer program. This semester, Matthew Whaley Elementary collaborated with William and Mary on a unique project in which pre-service teachers taking a reading methods course spent five classroom sessions observing at Matthew Whaley. Congratulations to Matthew Whaley Elementary School for earning this prestigious award uh, for their partnership in preparing our future teachers. Jamestown High School was selected for the exhibition Germany Unwrapped, funded by the Office of Foreign Affairs in collaboration with the Goth Institute in Washington, D.C. Germany Unwrapped is a traveling exhibition packaged in two large flight cases. It provides visitors with information about Germany and the German language in playful and humorous ways. You don't need to know any German to understand the exhibition as the images and objects speak for themselves. The two large display cases are located just outside the James High, uh, Jamestown High School cafeteria and they will be there until January 5th. They are ready to be explored by students, faculty and families. For the first time, WJCC counseling programs and New Horizons, New Horizons Regional Education Center partnered to provide 80 middle school, school students with the opportunity to participate in New Horizons Career Day. On December 7th, students from all three middle schools and their counselors traveled to Woodside Lane campus to learn about eight different programs offered through the Career and Techni Technical Education Center. In addition to rotating through different program presentations led by current students, all eighth grade attendees toured the campus and experienced different classroom settings. The purpose of this event was to broaden middle school student awareness of the various educational programs available to them as they set their career goals and prepare for the future. Those are all of the announcements I have this evening, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Any announcements or, announcements or uh, school board? I would just like to comment, Dr. Heron, I'm, I think it's very exciting that our eighth grade students had an opportunity to travel to Woodside. Um, I think letting our middle school students know early on about our career and technical options is phenomenal, and hopefully that will increase the number of students who access that. So, kudos. Thank you. Uh, 4.02, school spotlight. Dr. Heron? Mr. Chair, tonight we have a very special school spotlight for everyone. On the, under the direction of Carolyn Morse, the Warhill Honor School Choir will perform a holiday medley for us. Thank you, Mrs. Morris, and the school choir. Welcome.
Thank you. Any comments from board members? It's phenomenal. What a way to start a meeting. <laughs> I have to say one of the things I'm most proud of in, the, in, in uh, Williamsburg James City County is our performing arts and uh, the way the, the school system is able to support and the, what, and the good work that our, our kids do. Um, the the uh, choir here, I saw Peter and the Star Catcher at Jamestown a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago it, and it was... Uh, just an amazing performance. So it's uh, it's really it's truly really inspirational what our kids what our kids do and how uh, how well they do it. So thank you much. I, I, I have to echo that. I the I'm I'm really amazed at uh, the, the, <clears throat> not just the level of, of um, the performances of our our students in all of the arts, but um, I another area that um, I just think is phenomenal here are all, all the orchestras at the uh, at all the high schools are. I've been out there when they're practicing, and I, I, I you know, they could be the Virginia Symphony. I mean, they, they are just phenomenal. So it's great. And those of you who brought them along <laughs> from those very squeaky years um, when they were little kids, uh, it, it has certainly paid off. It's amazing the work that they do to, to oh, get them it, to where they are. It's, yeah.
I know you got the the musicals in the spring are you know just amazing that you have to kind of pinch yourself First with the high school and, and not not yeah, Broadway absolutely. quality. They really so, are. So thank you, thank you for that. That was thank you, Dr. Carroll. Dr. Carroll's not here. <clears throat> Thought he was here. Um, Five point zero one board recognitions. Mr. Chair, we have several student recognitions this evening. Let's begin by recognizing four Lafayette athletes for being named VHSL's All-State Team. Students, as your name is called, please join us at the front to be recognized and remain at the front for a group photograph. First of all, Amara Bland Haynes, All-State Cheerleading Team. Blaine Jones, All-State Cheerleading Team. <laughs> Jacob Smethurst, All-State Golf Team. Conrad Steck, All-State Cross-Country Team. We also have a number of Warhill student athletes to recognize for their individual accomplishments. Students, please come forward as your name is called and remain for the group photograph of all the state winners. Spencer Conte, All State Cross, cross Country Team. Ryland Haggerty, All-State Cheerleading Team. <laughs> Ashton Oti and Chrysanthi Preces were both named to the All-State Field Hockey Team. And we have four Warhill volleyball players were named to the uh, All-State team. They are Corey Clifton, who was also named All-State Player of the Year. <laughs> Alexis Pollard. Walters, and Chloe Wilmoth. Mr. Chair, we will, we will have more recognitions at the next regular board meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heron. That brings us to 6.01, citizens' comments. Dr. Beers? Uh, <clears throat> it is at this point in our meeting where citizens are invited to address the board. Those citizens desiring to speak have submitted speaker cards to the clerk prior to the start of tonight's meeting. These speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called state their names for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. It 
is the board's interest and desire that all comments are heard and respected. Hence, the citizens are asked to not engage in applauding, verbal outbursts, or any other type of demonstration during the presentations. Personal matters are not considered in public meetings. Therefore, the board requests that all speakers refrain from making reference to specific individuals in any form or fashion. Though the board may not respond to your comments, your comments are heard and appreciated. Each speaker is allocated three minutes to make their presentation. <clears throat> the board asks that you respect this time limit. Also, please be reminded that no time may be yielded to another speaker. Your acceptance and adherence to these guidelines will be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Beers. I'd just like to emphasize uh, all comments are made to the chair and um, three minutes is a time allotment. So there's a timer at the, at the podium. Mrs. Cook. Adrian Carter, please. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'd like to thank Ms. Owensby for attending our forum on Saturday. Thank you for your continued support. Um, my name is Adrienne Carter. I live at 100 Lauren Court, Jamestown District. Um, the WJCC School District is located in the epicenter of the military industrial complex. Um, it is, as I have stated before, akin to corruption that the people of this county and the school district specifically has failed to recognize the need to employ a junior ROTC program. Such a program would be used as just one of the tools to close this school district's double-digit Jim Crow achievement gap. WJCC can be described as an affluent community, yet smaller and less affluent school districts in the surrounding areas, York County and Surrey counties, for example, have identified the value in this program that it provides to different segments of their student population. <clears throat> Excuse me, ROTC, along with redesigning the way we deliver vocational and technical trade education and training in our, to our students, are two tools we can use to close this decade-old Jim Crow achievement gap. Back in the 80s, when I was a student at Lafayette, then the only high school here in James City County, WJCC provided a licensed practical nursing training and various vocational trade programs at the junior high and the high school level locally. What happened? I challenge this board to move out of your comfort zone and redesign the model for which we deliver and provide technical, vocational, skill education and training to our students. Explore a more regionalized approach, partnering with Charles City, New Canton, Richmond. How much money do we send to New Horizons each year? And are we getting the bang for our buck? Our school population is growing. We need to provide access to these skills to a growing population. My final statement with regard to the demographics and the lack of transparency of the demographics and volumes of students attending private schools in this school district, on this school district's dime. All of our schools are fully accredited, notwithstanding the double-digit Jim Crow achievement gap but based on a family's ability to afford litigation, they are awarded these vouchers. How much of our tax dollars are spent on this program? In closing, large checks to cover private schools, double-digit Jim Crow achievement gaps, vocational trade training capped based on regional accommodations. What does fully accredited truly mean? Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Carter. Janet Casanave, please. I hope I got that right. Good evening, <clears throat> Janet Cazanay from 3404 Waterview Road, Toano. <clears throat> and I have been reading in the paper about an online petition to ask for a resignation. I personally, I know just casually Sandy Young, but I think that I'm on the, the basic principle of the whole procedure is really not American. 
uh, to ask, to blame, to persecute somebody because their spouse has committed something doesn't seem like a normal way to, to treat somebody in, the, in this great land of America. I just think it's the worst thing that can happen. What did she do? She didn't do anything. And it's not, I mean, I'm sure all of you have had jobs and your, your spouse or your sons or your daughters, you don't spend 24-7 with them. You're going your own way, you're not glued at the hip, and I just don't feel that a spouse should be persecuted because of something that another spouse did, or even a, a, what a child did or anything. It's, it's just not American. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Jay Everson, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jay Everson, 103 Branskin Boulevard in the county. You know, if Chuck Young was in a medical facility for, let's say, AIDS, HIV, hepatitis, cirrhosis, there would be eyebrows raised because of how that's transmitted. But you know, Sandy would have uh, people supporting her. They'd be covering her and they would be in her corner. But we all know that that's not what the story is. Chuck Young um, is, you know, he's done some bad things. And he'll probably spend the rest of his natural life in a prison or in a um, mental institution such as Eastern State. Because when everything's all said and done, he suffers from an intractable uh, mental illness, has very low um, cure rate, healing rate. And I find it uh, amazing that here we are tonight, there's talk about her resigning. And just two blocks from here, in Colonial Williamsburg, I was photographed there when I was a kid. My kids have been photographed there. Those stocks where they put your hands in your neck. Because back in the 17th and 18th century, it was believed that public shaming would uh, get people on the right track. The problem here is that she didn't do anything. The scope of what happened with her husband, she found out just recently in court. Now, it seems to me that, if you, that these calls are setting a new standard, a new set of rules. And the calls are coming from the vice chair, the chair, the, the Ms. Bellis from the Gazette. And it says that your family members, that each of one of you is going to be responsible and accountable for what your family members do. You really want to go down that road? And I just, I just find it astonishing. And fortunately, Sandy is a woman of great faith. She knows that the Lord will see her through this and that uh, she, he will be with her to the end of time. God bless you, Sandy. And you, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Everson. Chris Henderson, please. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Chris Henderson, 101 Keystone. As a lifelong resident uh, of this area, I've seen my share of outrageous decisions and actions by local boards and committees. I've even appeared before this body to express my frustration, my displeasure, and concern with any number of matters, including the James Blair Middle School. The unprecedented action of this body to request the resignation of one of its members is simply without precedence. Sandy Young is an elected official unlike two members of this board, Ms. Hummel and Ms. Cook, who were appointed by city council. Sandy has committed no crime. She's, been not, she's not been charged with any crime and certainly hasn't been found guilty of any crime. The fate of Sandy Young rests with the voters of James City County and specifically the voters of the Berkeley District. And it is my sincere hope that Ms. Young remains on this board and completes her term. If it, is the judgment, if it is judgment that lies at the center of your concerns, I would suggest that each of you, except Dr. Beers, needs to take a hard look in the mirror. We live in America where there is a presumption of innocence, the rule of law, due process, and no guilt by association. This is not some banana republic governed by the hysterical or the moral, morally narcissistic. Based upon your collective actions towards Ms. Young, I would question your judgment and fitness for office. 
It is clear that those voting to seek Mrs. Young's resignation would benefit from a refresher in civics and perhaps some sensitivity training so as not to create a hostile work environment amongst the board. Let's say, for instance, that one of the members of this body was determined to be related to perhaps the, CE, the COO of Gawker. Would that individual be required to resign her position because of the filth spread by that organization? I think not. Sandy Young has dedicated her life to educating children. She has more experience in that arena than anybody else on this board. She has successfully raised seven children, mostly on her own, during her 20-year separation from her husband from 1992 to 2012. What? She was separated from her husband? Can't be. Doesn't fit our narrative or the fake news that we submitted to the local press. Did it ever occur to you that Ms. Young might be shocked and sickened by the charges against her husband as we are? I know for a fact that she is. Did it ever occur to you that most pedophiles operate in secret and keep those activities hidden from family and friends? Did it ever occur to you that Mrs. Young could be a victim as well? I can't imagine the courage it must have taken to turn in a loved one, a father, a husband, a grandfather. We should thank Sandy and her family for doing the responsible thing and for getting Mr. Young the help he so desperately needs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Barbara Henry, please. Good evening, Chairman Kelly, members of the board, Barbara Henry, 141 Devon Road. I am here this evening also to voice my request for the school board to drop any notion of pressuring Mrs. Young to resign. She is a competent member of the board uh, and a respected member of our community. There is no reason she should resign from her duties on the school board. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Henry. Elizabeth Keller, please. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and Board. I'm Elizabeth Keller at 100 Barrow, James City County. Sandra Young is a courageous, caring, and compassionate person who deserves our compassionate support as the victim of her husband's thoughtless, immoral, and illegal actions. She certainly does not deserve to be the object of a witch hunt seeking to accuse her of being complicit in her husband's offenses. Mrs. Young will be issuing a statement later this evening revealing several facts about when she knew what. One important fact is that she was separated from her husband for 20 years until 2012. The incidents when her son discovered pictures on his father's computer occurred when he was visiting his father. He never told his mother about them. Mrs. Young has been an actively engaged, productive member of this board for the last year under extremely stressful and trying circumstances. It is preposterous to assert that she is no longer capable of serving with honor and distinction. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Keller. Tim Mark, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tim Mark, 3923 Thorngate Drive, James City County resident. I'm here uh, for uh, Ms. Sandra Young as well, uh, for her support. And I think it's horrific what, what was coming in the papers. And Ms. Ownby, uh, what you- Please direct your comments to the chair. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Thank you. But, but it, it was horrific that you came out very quickly and, and you guys are a team and you cannot offer judgment. And you guys didn't even, you did not meet as a team before, and you all, and, and you were already offering comments and and judgments and offer and, and a resignation, and that that is horrific. And you should all look in the mirror and you should drop any charges. Miss Sandra Young, thank you for your years of service, and you know you're welcome in my house anytime. I have two children in this county, and this woman is is what we need in this county, and we all her her. Owe her a debt of gratitude, and thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Dorothea Matthews, please. Good 
Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dorothy E. Matthews, 303 Par, James City County. I rise to speak in support of Sandra Young, a caring, compassionate, highly competent woman of excellent character. Sandy voluntarily appeared before the federal grand jury investigating her husband, waiving her constitutional First Amendment right and protection against self-incrimination, doing so without a lawyer. As a lawyer myself, I know how serious it is to voluntarily testify before a grand jury. It takes courage and the knowledge that you have nothing to hide. Sandy is not in any legal jeopardy. Rather, she is a victim of her husband's behavior, and worse, the witch hunt being led by those who claim to support victims, but who clearly do not practice what they preach. It is a sad irony that the woman who has devoted a good part of her first year on the board to trying to combat bullying in the schools is herself being bullied. The claims that Sandy cannot manage her private life and the demands of the school board are ludicrous and hypocritical. If that is true, then every member of the board with a full-time job, minor children, or other family issues should stand up right now and resign. In closing, I quote from the December 3rd Virginia Gazette editorial, quote, Sandy Young so far has been an engaged and enthusiastic member of the school board, and that's just what the community needs to get through the next few years, unquote. I could not agree more. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Roseanne Redden, please. Good evening. Good evening. Roseanne Redeen, 4700 President's Court. I'm here to express my support for school board member Sandy Young. It is hard to believe that a story on the front page of the Virginia Gazette reporting a criminal investigation has turned into a vendetta against someone who has not been charged with any crime. Personally, this feels to me like a legal issue of defamation of character. As I prepared comments about the accusations, turmoil, and stresses Sandy has been forced to endure, a few words came to the forefront. Unwarranted, disgraceful, intimidating, biased, unproductive, enraging, hateful, and political. It seems evident that the local media, the Virginia Gazette, is acting like both the judge and jury by printing three consecutive front page articles about a certain criminal investigation. And the school board seems to be going along with their unseemly conduct. The first front page article on November 30th addressed the criminal investigation and mentioned that Sandy was the wife of the accused. She was not indicated as part of the crime. The second front page article began to address Sandra. It gave only a little more about the criminal investigation. It had a few quotes from Chairman Kelly. One, the board had received several calls or emails asking Sandra to step down. What charges were brought against her, I ask. Why were the names of these several people, were it two, five, 10, 50? Shouldn't they have to name themselves? Shouldn't the victim of accusations be given the right to meet the accusers? Meet them. Maybe you should make them appear here. Chairman Kelly was quoted, I'm sure she'll do what's in the best interest of her family and the school board. Voila, there was a third front page story and this criminal investigation story was mentioned only an iota. The story was now turned into a personal witch hunt against Sandra Young and contained a headline saying, some board members call for her resignation. No further justification for this or information was even given. No one has the legal right to attack Sandy when she has not committed or been charged with any crime. The Gazette has its own agenda and published it. That reminds me of another horrendous media mistruth called hands up, don't shoot. Very troubling that there are many citizens who believe everything they read in the media. Sandra is a duly elected official, a member of this board. She was elected for her qualifications as an educator and well-informed citizen. I have come to the conclusion that Sandra is not a member of the board who should step down. I would ask for anyone in the audience who is here to support Sandra Young to please stand at this time. Thank, Thank you, Mrs. Redding. Thank you. Sandy, this is... 
Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. Paula Sumrall, please. Good evening. I'm Paula Sumrall, 1720 Waverly Lane, Lenexa, the Powhatan School District, and a potential candidate for the school board. Sandy Young is my good friend, and I support her 100%. I learned about the confiscation of her husband's computer and other devices months ago, right after it happened, and certainly well before the rest of you knew about it. Despite being terribly upset at the potential allegations against her husband and fearful of the eventual outcome, she managed, and I don't know how, to show grace and professionalism in the execution of her duties on the school board and continued to do so even after innuendo and gossip and downright bullying by fellow members on the board e ensued when the news was made public. I'm a military spouse. My husband is a retired army general and he regrets that he cannot be here tonight and that's the reason I'm standing in front of you because I have a little thought on leadership. Anybody here tonight who has served this country in uniform or is a military spouse knows that one of the first signs of leadership, one of the first things you do, know your team and support their welfare. And I want to take the, th take the time to thank you, Dr. Beers, and I know you don't know who on earth I am, but I want to thank you, my husband wants to thank you for your calm head in this time of adversity, for your patience in dealing with other board members, for setting a good example, and most of all, for having a backbone and the willingness to stand up and, and take action and wait for all the facts to be gathered. You have kudos from us for your leadership, and I appreciate your kindness to my friend. You obviously know your team and look out for their welfare. And sir, I certainly hope and pray that you will become the leader of this board as we search for a new superintendent. The rest of you have been shameful. Thank you, Ms. Summerall. Avery Walters, please. Good evening, and uh, thank you for your time. Um, I'd like to, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'd like to recognize that uh, there's an issue in the, the school system. The students and teachers and staff of the schools are all deprived of sleep, or at least for the most part. <clears throat> and I'd like to um, request a motion for a poll among the students, teachers, and staff of the schools uh, regarding start times. Um, all right, let's begin with the paper. <laughs> uh, common sense to improve student achievement that too few have implemented. Let teens sleep more, start school later. It's in the best interest of students, teachers, administrators, and parents that this problem be addressed. To function at their most alert levels and to maintain the healthiest possible lifestyles, adolescents need more sleep and early start times at schools interfere with their natural circadian rhythms, making it almost impossible for them to get the rest they need. These are the words of the U.S. Education Secretary, Arne Duncan. Circadian rhythms tell us that teenagers should be asleep from about 11 p.m. to 8 a.m. However, this is cut short by a 7.20 start of instruction in the high schools. This, for us, waking up at you know, 5 or 6 a.m. is like an adult waking up at 4 a.m. This says we have to go to bed at 8 p.m. 
but with obstacles for me, such as band concerts and lacrosse practices that could cut into the 9 p.m., 10 p.m. hours, it's difficult to, to stay awake in first block at schools and keep my health up. I'd like to say that uh, we have a dilemma, and that's that common sense and an overwhelming amount of research tell us that we should start school later in the high schools, but this is cut down by complications and, uh, and intimidation of the expenses of change. I'd like to say that I've talked with students and teachers and staff, and um, the overwhelming response from all of them was that a later start time would, would be beneficial to us, and, well, sorry, out of time. Thank you very much, and, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing, and I'll, I'll try my best to reach out to all of you to follow up. I've contacted Dr. Beers, uh, no response yet. <laughs> thank thank you, Mr. Walters. Continuing the conversation with you Appreciate all. it. Thank you. Dr. John Whitley. After that rendering, I want a nap. Um, I'm John Whitley, 110 Governor Berkeley Road. I'm here to speak to an issue that faces us every single day, too, really. It's the equal employment outcomes and practices of our school system. It's the equal educational outcomes and practices of our school systems. We have some children who, a population that is not abandoned, but missed, not looked at with the love and care and compassion that they need to be. I also think that within our approach to how we recruit, retain teachers, we need to really look at what you had before you as a board in 2014, a teacher recruitment plan. I know we are trying to reach out more to HBCUs. Oh, by the way, that's historically black colleges and universities. There's a plan presented to the board in 2013 that gave a pretty clear direction of how to go about utilizing a citizen affirmative action advisory committee. As you know well, some of you, historically otherwise, that committee was abandoned along with other advisory committees. Got a lot of work to do, friends. Uh, we stand with you in your decision making and know that you're compliant as you see it with, with law. I only wish that those 12 or 13 people who spoke on behalf of a personal issue would motivate, motivate themselves to come stand up and be visible and vocal to speak on behalf of equal educational opportunities and equal employment opportunities. And I'm speaking about black folk being employed in our school system. I'm talking about ethnic minorities being employed in our school system. We've got to, we got to do better, absolutely. I commend you, Chairperson Kelly, for your determination, your decision making. I think that the process you, you engage in and the board engages in are, are appropriate as you're guided by law. I'm especially appreciative of the two appointed members of the city of Williamsburg. To me, you hold equal status. I only wish it were such that your voting power could be increased from one vote to 2.5 so that you have five with the rest of them. Thank you very much. Keep doing what you do. Happy holidays. Thank you, Dr. Whitley. That's uh, the end of our cards. So moving on to 7.01, Community Engagement Report from BWP Associates, Dr. Kastner and Dr. Harris. Oh, yeah. Fortunately, I'm starting to report, and I'd like to uh, 
tell the board members and members of this community how much we enjoyed our time learning more about this public school system. It was very impressive, and the outreach and the courtesy that we were afforded, we very much appreciate. To, tonight's purpose is to share what we found out in the hours that we spent in two full days and a few evenings in meeting with the board members. This paper trail is not something that just is going to end when we do this report. The board members have not had much chance to have a chance to review this because we just finished it earlier today. But what we're going to do is we're going to go through a, b a brief PowerPoint. What we're going to also do is share with you some preliminary data on surveys that about 200 people in this community have participated, and we know that that number is going to increase. Board members also have a 10-page report that is an annotated summary using the language that we received, not edited, from the community during the time that we were here, and also from the data sources that we're presenting you we have come up with a draft leadership profile that probably after this evening, the board needs to reach a consensus to see if it reflects what you view as what should happen for when we're looking at the next superintendent and will aid in how we would be screening candidates to meet the profile for your consideration of who you would choose to interview. If I could start first, what's the purpose of community engagement? It's to identify the perceived strengths and challenges of the public school system. So here you are, period five years ago, this might have gone on, but it gives a snapshot that validates, in many cases, what an excellent system you have, but also addresses certain challenges. It's the type of thing, when you're hearing about these strengths, it's the type of thing the HR department or future candidates are going to appreciate. It's also to identify and describe desired qualities and characteristics that the next superintendent should possess and demonstrate. And at the same time, it's to bring the community together along with people internally and externally to how the search process is going to work and how the board, in its way, is making a very transparent attempt to be inclusive for us to hear all of the information that will help guide you in your decisions. When we go through and we actually look at the legwork, the time we spent in the system was a qualitative time talking with people in which we had over 40 interviews and we talked with approximately 149 people. We also then have the quantitative data that I'm going to go through now, and Wayne is going to go through the results of the qualitative data from the interviews that we had. From the preliminary results, when you look at three significant strengths of the school system, it's no surprise that when you have 200 people, you look at 64, if you do the math, you're talking over 120 people, and that's a significant pattern talk about the excellent teachers and staff. One of the things uh, was so noted, one of your uh, students that we met made a comment, we have great teachers, they're not just in here for the paycheck. And he was very appreciative of that. And hearing it from the kids is important. When you talk about your good school facilities, whether it's the building of your middle school or the schools you already have, you're down to about a third. And when you look at the entire survey board members, you'll see that there's a number of other categories that people weigh in, but what we're trying to do is identify the most significant ones in the top three. It's no surprise the supportive community, 32%. We're talking about a high-profile community that supports education and has a high value. And the important skills you'd like to see in a superintendent, leadership skills. You're looking for a leader. You're not looking for someone that's in the status quo. You're looking at someone that will move the system on from the strengths it already has. 
You're then looking at communication skills. You'll notice that communication skills and interpersonal skills rank very highly in comparison to your other categories. What it suggests is this community would value a people person, someone that can be engaging and be a visible part of your community. When you look at other important characteristics you'd like to see, at the very top, integrity, commitment to the community. You're not looking for someone to, coming here to uh, build a career and move on. You're looking for someone that's going to have staying power. You're also looking at trying to go beyond the trend of superintendent change every five years or so. You're looking for a greater continuity from the people we talk to. You're also looking for a team builder. A team builder entirely not only as a superintendent with a school board, but also a superintendent with the staff, public, and the students. When you're looking for experience desired, at the very top, now when we had these categories, it's either strongly agree or agree, and we combine them. But when you see that, you're looking for experience in instruction and a classroom teacher at the very top. You're not looking for a non-educator. You're also looking for experience in strategic planning. And, and this happened in, as we met with a very diverse group of people. You have it stated here that experience in a multicultural environment because there's a complexity to this system as you find and know on the many different communities you have and also the interest in all students from each of these communities being successful. And that could be achievement gap, but also you're going to find it has a lot to do also with career pathways, not just be oriented towards college. The three most important issues or concerns in the next five years, educational options and programs. That coming at the top will have more annotative information when you read your report to show it's meeting the needs of all groups of students. You're talking about funding. Funding not only for your operational program, but also your capital program, and also trying to keep competitive sal salaries to attract teachers and staff, and also have them be retained, and also to compete to attract diverse candidates. And you're dealing with the issue of growth and the strain it brings. But in dealing with the issue of growth, you're also talking of the added complexity it's bringing to the students that you serve. What I'd like to do now is to turn this over to uh, Dr. Harris, and he's going to go over the qualitative part from the interviews. Right? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Heron, it's my pleasure to be before you to report to you the results from the community engagement discussions, interviews, and forums that we held on November 28, 29, and 30, you will note that there is congruence between the responses on the online survey and what we heard from the 149 individuals uh, who spoke with us uh, during the two and a half days that we were here. Uh, let me first refer you to pages 5, 6, and 7 because the responses under strengths are elaborated on in the statements that we heard. So if you go to page 5 of the long report, the community engagement report, you will see a section that refers to strengths. You will find some detail there. I will not walk you through all of that detail. Uh, but in essence, there are four broad categories of detail that appear there. Uh, the first broad category that corresponds to what you've already heard, we heard repeatedly that one of the strengths is the excellent, caring, and dedicated staff. They were referring to teachers. Uh, as well as other members uh, of the school division who support those who are in the classroom. Uh, the second category uh, of strength has to do with the size of the community, its location, and the quality of life that's here 
as well as a supportive community. Uh, I see the board members looking a little puzzled. Did I give you the wrong page numbers? Do you have a different document yeah, than I have? So it's this, re this report, right? Yes, that's the report I'm referring to. And that's uh, on the, in the board docs as well. If you don't have okay. A, I, hard copy. I, you can follow along. I can go back and answer any questions that you might have. Um, there, there's also high expectations for the continuation of, of strong schools. We heard that in a variety of statements. Uh, you should be proud that you, you are a world-class school district. You've been uh, fully accredited all of your schools for the past 10 years. You have a number uh, of rigorous programs. Uh, there's an expectation that students will be prepared for success uh, in their careers, whether they go on to college or university or not. And then the, the other broad category was the partnerships that you have with William and Mary and, and your community college, as well as some opportunities for uh, leveraging uh, additional resources from those colleges and universities that are in close proximity to you. We heard about the possibility at Hampton University uh, as one example. Uh, there are some additional comments on the page under strengths, uh, and, and they further help define uh, what we have on this particular slide. Uh, if you go to the bottom of page five and the, and the entire page six, you will see that there are a list of challenges in broad categories with uh, explanation. I will simply refer to the first four, uh, four broad categories. Uh, the first challenge has to do with ex educational op options. Uh, it was noted as we talk with individuals that there are some students whose options are limited uh, because they come with some deficits or they prefer to prepare themselves for going straight into the work well or into the military. Uh, and so there are options that need to be expanded for students in order to meet all students' needs. You have a growing population, uh, different population, diverse population, and there are options that need to be offered for those students as well. Second category, which uh, is really uh, part of the challenges that most school districts face this year, and that has to do with funding. Uh, there's competition for limited funds. Uh, you have two agencies, uh, both a city government and a county uh, government uh, that's responsible for helping to fund uh, the programs within the schools. So there's competition there. There's competition for funds to the operating budget as well as to your capital budget. And you also have this challenge around funding that has to do with redistricting your building a new, made a decision about a new middle school. And so there is this competition. That will be a challenge for you as a board and certainly for your next superintendent. Category three has to do with the transitioning school board. Uh, you have a board with four new, relatively new members who've only been uh, on the board now for, four, for a, a year. Uh, you have board members who will be coming up for uh, re-election or appointment uh, and you have a new superintendent who will be coming on board. So the transitioning that is going on presents a significant challenge in order that you can operate as a leadership team of eight rather than as individual body collective of seven versus one, your new superintendent. And then finally, you've experienced growth. Um, that is a challenge for you. You anticipate based on your projections that you will continue to have an increase in the number of students over the next several years, and that they will be a diverse group of students which will place uh, some burden and tension both on expanding programs as well as funding. So these are the broad categories of strengths and challenges. I would remind you that it's this information along with what I will present in the next slide that will help uh, define the broad categories you'll find in the leadership profile, which we will talk about in just a moment. We ask everyone we met with to identify the qualities, characteristics, attributes, and experiences that 
Kevin and I should look for in candidates as we are screening the pool who apply in order that we can present to you those candidates that are the best match and fit. And here is what we were told. Again, the detail is you will find on page seven, but we've highlighted a number of broad categories here. First and foremost, we were told that you are looking for an instructional leader who will have been able to demonstrate success in a high profile district and who will come with a track record of meeting the needs of students in similar settings to the school division. You want a collaborative leader, someone who will seek, listen to, uh, and use the uh, advice from others, someone who will be an excellent communicator. We heard over and over again that your next superintendent must be a communicator who will lift, listen emphatically to understand what is being said before they try to be understood. Someone who will support programs that address all students' talents, needs, and interests. We should be looking for an approachable, visible, and personable leader who will work with staff and community to continue to move the the school division forward, take it to the next level. We had one person say, take us from where we are, take us to greater than just being great. A leader who will strategically make the best use of available resources and will build relationships with the school board and county and city officials. A superintendent who will be student-centered who will be transparent, who will communicate, who will do that with unvarnished, unvarnished integrity. Someone who can communicate effectively with all individuals within this community and who will consistently advocate for and support teachers and staff. And finally, an energetic and courageous leader who will confront disparities and advocate for all students. We took the information from challenges, strengths, and then what are the attributes that we would look for. And we created four descriptors that you will see in the leadership profile. The first descriptor is an instructional leader. I've given you some detail about that. The second category is a collaborative manager. The third category, an effective communicator. And last, personal qualities. And so what we've done is to draft a leadership profile, which you have a copy of. It is draft. You have to approve it. So if you will pull up copy of the leadership profile. That's, on, that's in our board docs. That's in your board docs. Let me make a point. The leadership profile, the language in the profile is almost verbatim what we've already presented. So that whole alignment, it seems that to do it justice, you're going to have to have the opportunity which you haven't had. Look through the report look at the survey, look at the documentation, but we will tell you it's going to lead to these categories. And this is, these are just organizational. The purpose here tonight is not to have you get into wordsmanship over this because you haven't had sufficient time. But we would like you to find some mechanism that you could get board agreement, maybe have someone take uh, all the information from board members and consolidate it and come up with to see if, we, if we've got it right or if you want to make, and we encourage you to make edits so you own this because this is what we're going to use to vet the candidates. I would say we would like to have this back at, by the, at least the first week in January after you come back. We're not putting a timeline on it, but we also think because we've already explained all this, what you're going to see in the bullets is pretty much what we've already shared with you. 
And, and this document is important because as candidates are making a final decision to apply, they will look for specifics to determine if their experiences are, say that they are a good match and then therefore they will fill out the application. So it gives further direction and more depth as they are preparing. So is, so is the first week of January too late? Because um, uh, applications are due. The 24th of February is the cutoff. We're, we're tight. I, I, I just know this is a busy week. Uh, if you can get You're it right. done this week, it'd be great. <laughs> no, it's March. Your cutoff date is in March. February. No. No. It's February January 7th. is the date. Oh, February 7th, so we have to do it. No. January 23rd. Go on to the next slide. We'll, we'll, let, let's hit that right now. Can you go to the next slide, Wayne? When you're looking at your next step, you're getting your online survey results, and you're talking about January 18th. Sure. By us talking about having it that first week in January, or if you can get it before, any candidate we're going to vet, we're going to be using that profile. It will be up on our website also. So, uh, Mr. Kelly, if you could hit the end of this week, I, I think that would be helpful if you could. Yeah, I'm not sure if we can hit the end of this week, but um, certainly I think what we would shoot for would be the middle of next week. Let, let, let me offer a suggestion. Please. And this has worked uh, with the other boards we work with. If one member of the board is designated to receive any suggestions from the rest of the board and let that one individual at the most two make any revisions, it will go faster because seven people will not be able to do this uh, and do it efficiently. So that would be a suggestion. Committee is not going to work. Um, well, I mean, I think, I think board members have just got it tonight, so I would like to I'd like to give through the weekend for board members to review and comment on it. Um, if, if comments could be sent to me by Sunday night, does that, does that work for everybody? I can, I can collate it and get it back to you. I would shoot for Wednesday night. As long as we have it back and it's, it's your final uh, profile, we'll get it posted. I think you would have, I think it's great. Sunday night, all comments go to you, but then you need to somehow get them to back to us. S um, maybe, I don't know how quickly you can turn it around so that we can okay. uh, make sure that it's something we all agree to. Do you, okay. Does that make sense yeah. to everyone? Sure. That's what I was going to say. Um, I want to make a, another point that once we have this public document, would hope that it could be available where people in your community could see if we got it right. We also want to know if we got if if for some reason we've missed something and you board members are experts in your community, then you should take and make adjustments as you see fit. You know, there's a difference between coming in and visiting and all of a sudden knowing the depth of you as you live here. So that's the type of a way that we can work back and forth. Yeah, but you're the experts on this. Uh, I think we've done a pretty good job capturing it, but it shouldn't just stop there. So you want to continue? Well, what I'd like to tell you, and you're right, we have a pretty ambitious deadline, and we're, we already have over a dozen applicants. We think some might be waiting for over winter break. because It takes a while to do all that, and uh, we're going to keep working towards vetting. We're starting to narrow even down already. But you see the application deadline is January 18th, and we will be sending, we will be meeting with you to give you a slate of candidates on January 23rd. And because you're backward mapping by trying to introduce a new superintendent, and uh, Jim, I don't know if it was February 15th, but I know it was close to that date, that you have to get the interviews and you've got to get the uh, negotiations all done. So during a time when also board members are working on a budget, it's probably not ideal, but you are obligated of reaching that deadline. And we think we can make it work. And uh, I would say that one of the things that's working for you and the community is you have an excellent school system, a desirable place for people to want to come. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think yeah, I appreciate the, the, the applications probably waiting for the 
break. Um, however, they're also probably waiting for this leadership profile to get out. That, that we should see an uptick in applications once that's on there. Right. So, so if we if we look at moving that timeline so we can get it to you on on the Wednesday. So if I get comments from board members on Friday, collate them through the weekend, send them out to the board members, and then and then get it to you Wednesday, which I guess is the twenty first. We'll have it up on our site the next day. So when we get it, it'll go up. Does that work for board members for to get comments to me by Friday? Friday. I didn't say COB, but at the end of Friday. Does that does that work? Yeah. If we could, okay. could we could we get it in, in Word? Please. Oh yes, yes. Rather than a PDF, a Word document. Janet, maybe Although, could help with that. We've got software. By the way, we've been very fortunate. Yeah, Janet has been very supportive of this whole process. She's had to deal with all the details, and I yeah. very much appreciate her efforts. Specifically. Yeah, I think, I think it's important that we get it out before this, shutdown. This if you get it to us, we'll have it up within a day after we get it. Just this. Mr. Chairman, the are there other comments or questions, things that you would like for us to address? Board members? Go ahead. I would just like to thank you for going over and above. On, I know you uh, collected a little extra community uh, input after, your, uh, after you left town, so I appreciate that. Um, took that seriously, and, I, and it's important work. Any other comments from board members? No, I mean, I, I appreciate the good work that you guys have done and the flexibility to uh, meet with the community, um, meet with the, the different members of our community, different groups. I think that uh, was extraordinary. I know several members attempted, attended all the community for, uh, open uh, community forums that you had, um, and you got a great uh, breadth and even depth of, uh, com of uh, comments there. So uh, I appreciate, appreciate your good work, and uh, we'll read the uh, leadership profile, and get that back to you as soon as we can so we can uh, get that out there. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, board members, before we move on? Happy holiday. Thank you. Happy holidays to you as well. But we'll be in touch before then, won't we? <clears throat> uh, so that takes us 7.02, auto report for the year ended June 30th, 2016. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Annually, we bring uh, an audit report to you um, of the previous year's finances, and Ms. Berta is here to introduce this item this evening. Thank you, Ms. Berta. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. Annually, we have to go through a, an audit um, with Dixon Hughes Goodman, and I'm pleased to have with us tonight Ms. Leslie Roberts, who is a partner with Dixon Hughes Goodman. She is here to introduce our auditor and to give you our audit report for fiscal year ending June 30th, 2016. Um, good evening. Um, I'm just going to kind of go over the highlights, and then Rob's going to get into a little bit of the details. Um, but basically, the audit went very well. Everybody was prepared for us, and they worked with us, and they were attentive throughout the time that we were scheduled to be here. We actually had a much better audit this year than we've had in prior years because we did a lot of pre-planning and meeting. We got together, and we actually changed the schedule of when we do the audit and kind of worked with each other really collaboratively, and it just went very smoothly. Um, pleased to report that everybody, that we had a good audit. There's two reports within the audit. Rob's going to go into some detail. But basically, you had an unmodified opinion, which means we were able to come in here as a third party, look at your records, and opine on them that, that it, they present fairly not only the operation but the position at the end of the year. And there's also another report that we present that's part of your financial package, and it's a report on internal control over financial reporting. And again, another clean report. We didn't have any um, significant deficiencies or material weaknesses to report to you. There's another required correspondence that Rob will go into, and that was, again, a clean report. Most of it's boilerplate, but he's going to just get, dive into a little bit more detail. But overall, the audit went well. In fact, much better than in the past because we did a lot of collaborating up front. So they should be commended for the job they've done. 
and Rob's going to go detail. Rob Odin is the manager on your engagement, has been the manager for several years. Good evening. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here again with you this year to talk through the results of the audit, not only of the school's comprehensive annual financial report, otherwise known as the CAFR, uh, but also the financial statements of the activity funds. Uh, so, you know, as I've as I've mentioned before, um, you know, this, and I, and I see some fresh faces up here as well. I'm not going to go through in extreme detail on this 130-page document. But I do want to give you a, a brief roadmap to where if you're going to spend any time with this, uh, this document, uh, it'll point you into, into the right direction. Uh, so with this CAFR, this Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, for fiscal year ended June 30th, 2016, there's four major areas. Uh, the first is the introductory section, and in that, that includes uh, the letter of transmittal, which is a letter from the management of the school board to you, the school board members. Uh, also, next section would, uh, that would qualify as a major section would be the management discussion and analysis, the MDNA. This is on page 13 through 22. If you're going to spend any time with these financial statements, I would suggest starting with the MDNA. It's an executive summary of the financial position and results of operations of the schools for fiscal year 16. Then you get into the kind of the nuts and bolts of the financial statements, the, uh, the, the, the government-wide financial statements, the fund financial statements, and the footnotes to those financial statements. That's on pages 26 through 79. This is where you're going to get in to see the detailed assets and liabilities, revenue and expenses of each of the major funds of the school board. The last major section is the statistical section, uh, pages 83 through 128. And uh, this is, you know, roughly 40 pages or so of historical financial data, presenting 10 years worth of data, or so you can look at uh, various trends of financial positions of the school, revenue and expenditure levels, expenditures per pupil, uh, economic information of the Williamsburg, City of Williamsburg and James City County. Those are the four major sections. I'd also like to point out, too, on page 9 and 10 of this CAFR, that again this year the school board has received uh, the Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting from not only the GFOA, uh, but also uh, the Association of School Business Officials. Uh, and we believe that after the audit and review of the 2016 CAFR, which I'm here discussing with you tonight, it will also receive uh, this same Certificate of Excellence. Now, Leslie briefly mentioned the results of the audit reports, but I'd kind of like to go a little bit more in detail with those. The first audit report in the financial statements is on page 11 through 22, or 11 and 12. And on page 11, the, report, the independent auditor's report, you can see the bullet points in bold, italicized, kind of the paragraph headings. And they go through and they talk about management's responsibility during the audit process, the auditor's responsibility during the audit process, and then kind of what you guys really care about, the opinion paragraph at the bottom of page 11. And there's where, as Leslie mentioned, uh, you are receiving an unmodified opinion on these financial statements, the highest level of assurance the CPA can give on a set of financial statements. The next page, page 12 of that audit report, uh, the first few paragraphs titled Required Supplementary Information and Other Information go through a little bit further detail about what sections of this CAFR our audit report extends to and our opinion covers. Because while we are auditing and giving our opinion on the basic financial statements and the footnotes and a few additional schedules, we're not giving an opinion on the management discussion and analysis, the introductory section, or the statistical section. Although we did read those areas and make sure they agree back to the basic financial statements that we did audit. Uh, so that kind of gives you a little more detail about where the audit opinion uh, covers. The last paragraph, Other Reporting Requirements by Government Auditing Standards, references back to the second audit report within this CAFR, which is in the very back section of the compliance section, pages 129 and 130. And that's where, under government auditing standards, we're required to uh, not only review the internal controls, 
uh, around financial reporting of the school board, uh, but also look at their compliance with laws and regulations where if there was a violation could have a material impact on these financial statements. Pleased to report again there was no internal control deficiencies that raised the level of material weakness uh, that we're required to communicate with you, as well as there's no compliance issues or findings uh, that are required to be reported to you. The only, uh, you know, last year I, I talked to you about a, a new uh, Government Accounting Standards Board pronouncement that had significant changes in these financial statements. Uh, and it took us a lot of significant work to implement GASB 68 uh, for the, the pension liability uh, that was required to be booked with, with regard to the Virginia retirement system for your professional and non-professional employees. This year, um, there are no new accounting pronouncements or, or new GASBs that had any significant effect on these financial statements. But there is one additional footnote that I wanted to draw to your attention. It's footnote number 11 on the bottom of page 69. The last paragraph, it talks about the newly formed uh, Jane, Williamsburg James City County Educational Foundation and how that organization is related to the Williamsburg James City County School Board and the activity the two entities had with each other during, during the fiscal year. Now there's also a, a management letter, a letter uh, Required a required communication to those charged with governance you the school board uh, I believe that's also in your board docs and uh, you know, This letter as Leslie mentioned has some boilerplate language that walks through and talks about um, What what the major estimates are in these financial statements these estimates have not changed from previous years uh, They're with regard to the actuarial assumptions for not only the other post-employment benefit liability But also the pension liability uh, there's also estimates with regard to depreciation and the use for lives of assets. Uh, this letter would also go into discussing the fact that there are no new accounting principles or um, policies that were adopted this year, as well as any significant um, difficulties we had during the audit process, which I'm pleased to report there were none. Now, we also audited the activity funds, the combined statements of cash receipts and disbursements. I was going to go through with an asking question at the end. And uh, as part of that audit, we go out to each of the 15 schools and we uh, use audit sampling techniques to sample the cash receipts and disbursements at the activity funds. And the, uh, the, the culmination of that audit is, again, we've issued a, a clean opinion, an unmodified opinion, that the combined statement of cash receipts and disbursements of all 15 schools is materially correct in accordance with the cash basis of accounting. What? What pages are those listed under? So that's a separate document. It's a separate document. It's, it's in within board docs. It's labeled um, combined statement of cash receipts and disbursements. Content. Okay. The audit report on that uh, document is on pages one and two. Uh, and again, an unmodified opinion. So again, the highest level of assurance the CPA can give on a set of financial statements. We also issued a management letter with regard to that audit as well. And again, this year, uh, reporting to you, there is a significant deficiency in internal controls with regard to um, se segregation of duties. Uh, now, this is commonplace. We've, had, we've reported this every year because it's not economically feasible for you to have multiple bookkeepers within each school to have one person take the money to the bank and another person record the transaction in the school system. It's just not possible. But in this case, the principal is serving as a, as a, as a go-between or a, a, uh, a compensating control in that area so that even though there is some segregation of duty issues because the bookkeeper has to do everything, uh, the principal is serving as a review and approval process to review what the bookkeeper does and approve all the cash disbursements. There are also detailed findings within the following pages of that document that kind of walk through the specific findings per school. The only pervasive issue is just the, the timing of um, when a, a teacher will turn in the funds to the bookkeeper. It's supposed to be deposited daily, and every once in a while you get the teacher holding funds overnight and giving the, the funds to the bookkeeper the next day. That's um, pretty common from the last, last 10 years of auditing with you guys. You guys do a great job within the activity funds. Um, 
and the comments I find here at James City County, Williamsburg James City County School Board are significant, significantly less than many other school systems that we work with, so you're to be commended for that. Again, it was a pleasure to work through the audit this year with your accounting department, uh, Mrs. Uh, Christina Berta and Renee Ewing and Beth Carpenter and their staff do an excellent job of preparing for us and do an excellent job of preparing these financial statements for us to audit. If there's any questions, I would ha be happy to address them now. Board member questions? Go ahead. Do. Tell me. Um, I got one. Well, I'm glad to hear that there weren't compliance issues. I do have kind of a picky question with regard to our, the major initiatives on page five. I was, it was just curious to me that we um, highlighted one particular subgroup, and I was wondering why we didn't note um, achievement gap for all of our subgroups, why, why one subgroup was noted. That might be something that Ms. Berta would That's answer. probably something Ms. Berta would have to address. This is a document that we prepare every year, and we do update those sections. We certainly can review that again and, and expand upon that. Um, there are other documents in the division that highlight those, so we pull out pieces to include and incorporate for our submission of that document and the publication of our financials. But if that's the desire of the board to expand that, we certainly can work with our uh, school performance department to it just, expand It that. just seemed odd because we note that our initiative is to um, ensure that we're educating all children. And sure. so that's just it looked it seemed odd to me that we're only noting one particular subgroup. We can look at that. Sure. Thank you. Ms. Dr. Beers. Yeah, I have, I have a question. I'm looking back at page 69 last paragraph about the education foundation yes sir at that sentence um, I guess it, that's the second long <coughs> sentence the foundation is a nonprofit organization organization established to receive private donations contributions to be used for the benefit of the students of WJCCPS and is jointly governed Citizens of James City County, citizens of the city of Williamsburg, WJCC School Board. Can you explain that? So there are what various. Is, yeah. So there are various. I, I, my, go ahead and then I'll tell you what my assumption was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's various board members that are nominated or voted to participate on that governing board, and those are coming from those three bodies City of Williamsburg. James City County and the school board. So those three bodies nominate officials to serve on that board and therefore that organization is jointly governed by the three um, city, county, and school board. Okay, so it's not an independent organization? It is an independent organization. Yeah, that's what I thought. So Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand the word govern. It is jointly governed by those three bodies who have nominated people to that board. It is not a uh, it is not a component unit or a joint venture of the school board. It is not legally connected to the school board. It is independent. But the school board does so if we have votes on that board. The foundation can ignore it. They can, yes. I uh, to that point. Uh, I am the education foundation representative on the board. I'm not sure if we are handling that appointment the same way that we're handling other uh, committees and boards. And I just didn't, I, I'm throwing it out as a question because. Yeah, the, uh, the board of directors of the foundation is made up of citizens from the city, the county, and a member of the school board. So um, we do not appoint a member to the education foundation. The Education Foundation elects a member of the school board, so so they they invite a member of this a specific member of the school board to attend. The school board does not um, appoint somebody to that to that board of directors. So so, and I know it's sort of getting off the topic, but it is a work session, and we sort of talk about. One of my uh, so the question I have related to that. Is the foundation can actually go on and operate on its own, decide they want to do something for the school district, or decide, which would be kind of a, um, 
instead of coming to the board first, they just operate independently and then the, do something. Uh, at our next meeting, the, bo the uh, foundation board will come to us with uh, their gift, and we can choose not to accept it if we don't like. No, I'm not talking the about the gift. Uh, you know, I'm talking about anything they might you know, um, want to do. I, I know, for example, that they scheduled a meeting without contacting the board about that, and it was a, I think it was a pretty significant meeting. Or that they, no, I'm sorry. They scheduled a meeting, and it happened to be the exact same time as the school board meeting. And it was a fundraising effort. And I, I would have thought it would be really important to have school board members there. That's just an example. Right. Checking, you know, just sort of, right. you want to do this, does it fit into your calendar? Or that, that's what I, that, that's a minor sort of thing, but I'm just, uh, I'm just curious about how it, how it operates. And um, so I was intrigued by the word governed. Mm -hmm. Understand. I'm not sure what it meant. Okay. Still not sure, but I, I, I understand. I understand. Okay. I have yet to read this, and so um, I plan to do that, and I'm sure I'll have questions. <laughs> Dr. Heron and Ms. Berta know that, so um, thank you. But just re with regard to the, uh, the foundation, um, I think, um, if I'm not uh, mistaken, it's not it's it's the school board but also the superintendent sits on that board as well that's correct yeah so so just in terms of the accuracy of that i think there's two things um i think the relevant thing to the school division in, in terms of an audit in our financial position is that if something happens to the foundation it's in their um, governing uh documents that any assets they have roll into our possession so i think in terms of even though we may not be able to quantify that in a, at a future date if, if that organization goes away, its assets become ours, if I'm correct. So that I think that's relevant and should be noted. I'll have to look back through the organizational documents of, of the organization, but these are your footnotes, and if you want to tweak the wording of this footnote, as long as it's materially correct within generally accepted accounting principles, we're gonna be okay with the wording of that footnote. Any other comments from board members? I just wanted to thank Mrs. Berta and her staff for um, all the hard work and it's it's really nice to sit here and hear all of the basic accolades from our CPA auditors so thank you yeah thank you mrs. Berta, and thank you sir uh, you know the uh, the uh, minor inconsistencies at the school sites with all the moving parts that are there um, that's that's uh, I think a job well done by our school book <coughs> And uh, Mrs. Berta giving them guidance as to how they how they should perform. So I think that's great. Thank you. Thank you for your time. <coughs> Happy holidays. That takes us to 7.03 design process update on the Lafayette High School Auxiliary Gym. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This evening we're going to have an update on uh, progress uh, in the auxiliary gym project and Mr. Snipes is going to introduce our guest this evening. Um, our information this evening will include um, the value engineering on the gym as well. Thank you, Mr. Snipes. Good evening, um, school board chair, school board members, and Dr. Heron. <clears throat> in July of 2016, the board awarded the design of the Lafayette High School Auxiliary Gym to HBA, uh, which stands for Hargrove Brockwell Associates. Um, since that time, we have conducted uh, a review of VE, Value Engineering, and Mr. Jack Hastings from HBA is here tonight to bring you up to date on that design. Um, we are in the design development phase of this, of this, uh, of the project. Um, the next couple of phases will include a construction document phase, uh, a bid award phase, and then the project closeout. So without further ado, Mr. Hastings from HBA. Good evening. Um, my name is Jack Haston. I'm an architect working on the uh, gymnasium addition project. Um, currently, the project is approximately 50% uh, through design, and we're, we're still on schedule. Everything's moving along uh, as it should in accordance with our schedule. 
Uh, the latest activity that we've done since I was here last relates to uh, a value engineering process and um, I was just wondering if you all have any questions at all about what that process entails. Um, so if not, um, the process actually results. Yeah, well, I guess what were some of the um, uh, what were some of the areas that were identified? Just I'm, I'm just curious to see. Sure. And which ones you you know thought were. Are you asking in regards to the criteria for the value engineering, or are you asking what the process included? When it started, what, are you, what is your specific question in regards to? So, can I help? When, yeah, but I, I don't, I'm not quite. I think, I think what you're asking us for is what items were identified as yeah. being value engineering, which ones did you accept yeah, and which one ones did you, did you not? And, okay. Which ones did you discuss? I'm sorry. Is that fair? That's what I said, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm sorry, do we have this? Any of these? No, documents? we do not have that on our. It's not. It's not on our board docs. We just have it right there. Just right here. Is there any way we can? Oh, so it's not on our board. Yeah, I is there any it. way that someone could send these? No, to we us can cert We can certainly provide the detailed documents after this evening. Absolutely. Get down. Sit down there. We can sit down there and watch. There's a curve in there. You can just sit down there. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Ms. Tracy. Sure. Oh, uh, wait a second. So you, uh, the value engineered stuff, are you going to send us the issues that we looked at in value engineering and what we, what we decide to do, what we decide not to do? Um, he's going to go through that tonight. Oh, okay. That's and then, that. and Got it. So, and then we'll get a copy of it. So from an from yes. a, uh, overall standpoint, there were about 20 items that were reviewed and agreed upon in terms of them being worthwhile and valuable in proceeding with. So um, when you zip all the way down to the bottom, it, it represents about $200,000 in savings to the project, which we think is important um, in that um, because of some soil concerns that we have, we just wanted to make sure that we had enough money in the, in the bid to accommodate that. Uh, and also, to add to the project contingency for those things that may be unforeseen, that may be encountered with respect to soils specifically. So um, I'm certainly willing to go through all 20 items. Um, and if well, that's uh, what you'd like, I can certainly do that I really um, would not pretty like easily. That. Can you can you do things that are 50,000 and over? Sure. OK, so the um, we don't have many of those. So I'll, I'll kind of lower the bar to um, say uh, just the, the larger items, about 20,000. Uh, so we're looking at substituting or changing the, um, the roofing system. Uh, that results in about a $20,000 savings. We're looking at modifying, and this is uh, A7.0, so the numbers are on the left. Um, the um, storage room, we're thinking about reducing the, the width of that, not impacting the quantity of materials that can be stored there, but just reconfigure the storage room to save some square footage. Just um, the roof, or going from what material to what material? Okay, um, currently it's a two-ply modified bitumen. That was what was being um, specified. And what was being suggested is a single-ply TPO membrane, to, and that results in about a $20,000 savings. And Has there been any problems with Jamestown High School's roof? Has it been fine as far as we know? There have been no problems with the Jamestown roof. Yeah, and this is just for, of course, just for the gymnasium addition. Yeah. I hate it when people say that. Um, another uh, thing that was proposed was to delete all three vestibules, and we're, we're, we think that's a good thing to proceed with, but change that number from three to one. We think maintaining two of the three vestibules is important. It still results in a savings. Um, another uh, item. I'm sorry, can you go back? Sure. Uh, on the, uh, what's, where's, where are these vestibules that you're talking about? Corners like what are, bit. what are they? If you could go back and. Yeah. Okay, right one there, more. those three right there? Yeah, so. Um, the vestibules serve 
two really important functions. So the uh, gymnasium floor is wood, so the idea with the vestibules is it provides a barrier for moisture to the floor. Um, so we, we recommend keeping the two vestibules that are on the bottom, and then the vestibule that's in the upper right-hand corner to uh, delete that vestibule. And because of the quantity of people there, the three exits are required, so we would have an exit that would go directly uh, to the top through the exterior wall of the, the gym play area. So this, this would also be related to the storage, athletic storage, which is on the right. Um, we'll reconfigure that based on the other item that was mentioned as a cost savings item. So, so it takes up that, that space? It, it will be extended <coughs> to go all the way to the top wall yeah, by, the, by where the vestibule is now. Yeah. And so by doing that, we don't have to worry about possible water damage to the gym floor? Well, what we'll, what we'll do is um, there are different types of um, trims that you can use for, for, um, for water resistance and also for drips. Uh, we may also provide an awning um, that we would protect the door from wind-driven rain, which is, <coughs> which is the major concern. I know that, that damaging the wood floors has happened at our rec center multiple times. It, it can happen very easily if the door is right off of the gymnasium area. So is that going to be like an emergency exit door? It, it is. Uh, it is. There's um, three exits that are required based on the number of people, and so that's, that represents a required exit that we do need, in addition to the two that are in the lower left and lower right-hand corners of the gym. Okay. So we, we didn't, um, the usable square footage of uh, the, that hasn't, you didn't change, that hasn't changed, you didn't reconfigure anything around that. In, in terms of the, uh, the addition itself? Yeah. It does get reduced. The overall yeah. square footage does get reduced. So currently the, uh, the way it's, the way the um, proposal is written, currently the storage area is 20 feet wide. So we're reducing it from 20 feet to 14 feet. So, so that so that gives you're, you're that you know that gives the students so that if I understand what you're saying they're going to have more usable surface in the actual gym itself. Am I well? The the actual gym there's no impact to to reducing the area within the gym area. It's it's limited to the storage area and then the combined vestibules at the upper upper right and lower lower right. Yeah. The actual gym itself. Word. Remains the same. Okay, good. Just want to make yeah. sure. So, what's giving if it's 14? It's going from how wide to, how, to 14 feet? Huh? Cur 20 to 14. Currently, it's 20 feet Twice. wide, and now it'll be 14 feet wide. So, you're losing six feet. Where's it coming? Where Where are you gain? What's. Okay, what I'm so. I'm trying the, to say, like, if you've got, if it's 20 and it's going to 14, then what's. Giving like what are you Is it going back this Is way? Is it going back this way, or you get your if you're not so the, giving the wall the wall where the highlighter is now uh -huh. it's basically moving to the left six okay. feet got it yeah oh, okay oh, oh. got it and, but it, the space is also being reconfigured because we're capturing this the area where the vestibule is so we are changing the wall location but we're basically reconfiguring the storage area and does that what is E L and C O N C I'm sorry. E L down at the bottom, the green. Elevation. Oh, it's it's electrical. Electrical. I mean, so so that's got to be. You're losing six feet there too, right? That's, so that's correct. That, Between that's, the electrical closet and the, con it's a concessions area, a limited concessions area. That that also will be reduced. Okay, so the concession area itself is going to be. We'll take we'll take out the minimum area that we need to accommodate that six foot change. So the concessions will be smaller, but storage space is, is unchanged? Well, storage gets reconfigured, um, so we are reducing it, the width by six feet, from 20 feet to 14 feet. Right. The, we, height, the height stays the same. We can still store stuff because we can go up, but not this way. But concessions will get smaller. <clears throat> I'd like to go back to a low ticket item, the basketball hoops. Sure. Okay. So how, many, so how many hoops does Jamestown have? For like 
like is that like standard if we just have two like I'm, how many hoops do you normally have in an auxiliary gym well so the what's being proposed here is not to get rid of them but it's to take um, it's called an additive alternate bid item so if we're satisfied with the bids the bids come in within budget and we're also comfortable with the project contingency then that's something that would be added to the project and what we'll do is we'll word word our bid document so that we can have a little bit of a leeway between bid opening and when we can actually elect to take that once we know what our costs are so it, it gives you flexibility uh, in terms of award and also if you can afford it then those goal, those basketball goals would be brought back into the project um, at a predetermined price. Um, these, these goals are the goals that are on the sides of the courts. And of course, the main court, those, those goals are in the base bid. I guess, wait, to, um, to belabor the point, so like, how, do we know how many, how many? Jamestown want, has two. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Okay. I'm assuming they have been kept in as an alternative bid. So if the construction bid comes in under bid and there's money available, there is an opportunity for the board to vote that in as an alternative bid at the time, if, if appropriate at the time. So truly, if we're just talking about the larger, um, the larger items, the next larger item relates to the lighting type within the lighting source within the gymnasium. Um, and with that one, LED is currently what, what's specified, and we really think that that's the best choice. Um, but if it's required for funding related to the bid, there is a savings of about $20,000 to go to fluorescent versus LED. And um, that's an item, too, that we'll, um, we'll take as an additive alternate bid item. And if we can afford it, that's the, um, what's specified currently is the preferred light fixture source for the gymnasium. This is really helpful. Thanks. Oh, so good. Um, the process was really good. Um, I think a lot of times people think of it as uh, a negative thing, but there was a lot of good dialogue with the independent consultant that was hired, that you guys hired. So the process was very good and it occurred over a two day period. Um, yes, ma'am. Can you ask me a question? Go ahead. Yeah, I just have a question about cost savings when it comes to paying for the difference between fluorescent lights and LED lights. I mean, is twenty thousand dollars going to make? Are we going to be saving twenty? I mean, what is the cost differential for those two things for the use of the lighting? Well, the, the forecast on the cost savings to go to fluorescent is is in fact twenty thousand um, dollars. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the electrical bill at the end. Oh, oh, oh in terms of efficiencies. Right. Right. Um, the LED is probably probably is more more efficient from a from a power usage standpoint. Uh, it is. So when when you do uh, these kind of studies, do you take into account um, the long term maintenance issues or the uh, savings or not or lack of savings in electrical um, bills? Without a doubt, we do, yeah. Um, and that's, that's part of the challenge because we feel like, in this case, LED is what was specified. We really think that's the best decision um, for, um, for the school division. Um, but at the same time, we do know that money, um, money is an object. You have a very, we have a very defined budget, so we just want to make sure our bids are within budget and that we've also provided some contingency for anything that's unforeseen, such as unsuitable soils, which can be challenging um, for any project, much less um, our project here with you. I just want to remind the board that we have started uh, putting LED lighting in to all of our other gymnasiums. So this will be consistent to what we're doing with every, in every other gym.
No, this is this was very helpful because there's uh, been a lot of discussion about this, Jim, over this past year. And any time we have an opportunity to get additional information like that, that's that's really helpful. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions about the process or any of the line items? <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Go ahead. So um, I, I do have a question about process. I think there was a milestone event at James City County tonight. Do we know what happened? Yes, Mr. Schnipes can speak to that. There, there is a meeting of the county as well. Yeah, tonight there is a board meeting, uh, the Board of Supervisors. Uh, Alan Robertson and a member of Kimberly Horn are there tonight for the SUP approval. I uh, have not got a text from Alan yet, but we're supposed to be texting each other, let each other know what's going on. I was hoping on, so we would know by now. I'll, I'll, I can check right now if you'd like, but I don't think he's texting me. So. And can you just remind us in the public what the next steps are? So yes, the, the next steps after, the, um, after the, tonight is we will do... Uh, we will have the uh, you'll have another board meeting with the final design so that we plan to bring that to you in January um, with with these VE recommendations what the what it should look like it shouldn't change that much Jack are you still here it should not change that much um, from uh, what you're what you've just heard about the removing <coughs> of the vegetables um, some other things you wouldn't be able to see plumbing me mechanical uh, after that in March we will have the IFB for the construction so we'll the construction documents will be created we'll put out an invitation for bid um, for those construction for construction uh, in May we will start construction management all facilities of this size and nature anything over a million dollars we want to do construction management or construction administration on which will assist operations with project management we're doing the same thing with Blair um, once construction management starts uh, hopefully in June uh, we'll have a discussion uh, for construction and construction management and then you will award in um, at the second meeting in June the construction and the construction management contract at the same time we want them to start out at the same time it's, it's just a hand in hand parallels kind of walking through everything together so one person's not getting or one company's not getting information that the other's not getting and we also want our construction management firm to be able to monitor what the construction company's doing so, um, once that starts you have your you have your groundbreaking and we're off running and the facility is supposed to be ready by September 2018. Perfect. Any other comments from board members? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Snipes. Keep us informed. 7.04, equity through engagement. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If you remember last month, we brought our first in a series of presentations on the subject of equity through engagement. And at the first um, presentation, we presented an overview of how all students are engaged in excellent instruction. We defined equity, and we talked about addressing equity issues as part of our fulfilling our mission within WJCC. Um, this evening, uh, I'm delighted to, to ask Renee Dino to join us to present on our Bright Beginnings program. Um, this is one of the ways in which we impact the barriers that poverty presents to our children with regards to student achievement and student success. And Ms. Dan is here to present this evening. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Our mission in Bright Beginnings is simply to provide each student what he or she needs in order to be successful in school or in life. The brain research has identified the extreme rapid rate of brain development during the first five years of life. It has always made good educational sense to provide high quality early childhood education programs. But Nobel Prize winning economist James Heckman has been pointing out the economic benefits for over 20 years now. This community recognized the benefits of early childhood education programs decades ago. In 1976, the Norge Early Education and Development Center, lovingly known to staff and families as the Need Center, was established um, to educate children identified with special education needs, children with a developmental delay or a disability. Right Beginnings was established in 1983, and that was done as a federal demonstration grant to provide 
early childhood services to children at risk. The first Bright Beginnings classroom was at Matthew Whaley Elementary School and um, later moved to Rawlsburg. In 1996, the two separate early childhood programs were combined under the Bright Beginnings umbrella so that all children were served in classrooms together um, and, and served closer to home. In 2002, Williamsburg James City County was recognized um, as one of 10 communities as a community of excellence. It was a national award and it was presented in Washington, D.C. There were a number of community members um, who received the award in Washington, and the award was really for the development of a seamless system of early childhood services for children from birth to five. And the group of people who went to Washington to accept that award were from Child Development Resources, the Community Action Agency, Williamsburg James City County Public Schools, the City of Williamsburg, and James City County. An essential component of the Bright Beginnings program from the very beginning has been family engagement. Teachers provide monthly home visits to each family, and families have the option to do those home visits either at home, um, at school, or in some cases at their work site. I'd like to give you a little bit of a snapshot of who our Bright Beginnings students are. They range in age from two years to five years when they're ready to move on to kindergarten. And the numbers on this slide represent the children who are currently in our classrooms right now. So over 50% of our children are children who have a developmental delay or a disability. 43% are children who have identified adverse childhood experiences. We used to refer to those as risk factors. Um, but adverse childhood experiences um, is something that's come out of the research from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. But they are risk factors. 55% of our Bright Beginnings population are economically disadvantaged. 47% are minority students. 53% are white. And 42 of our 327 students currently enrolled are from families whose primary langu language is not English. And those, um, there are families that represent 12 different languages just within our Bright Beginnings program. This slide gives you information about the Virginia's Foundation Blocks for Early Learning. And the foundation blocks for early learning were developed for four-year-old students, and it gives information about what children should um, learn in preschool as four-year-olds. So you see content information here. What you don't see are the skills and abilities, the how of learning. Um, things like attending and engaging, persistence, self-regulation, curiosity, creativity, and problem-solving skills. These are all foundational skills to being able to learn new information. And in Bright Beginnings, we have a very intense focus on these foundational skills, how we learn. Once children learn how to learn, then new information is easy to absorb and connect. If you've not visited one of our Bright Beginnings classrooms recently, um, I have a quick video tour um, to give you some sense of what our classrooms look like. These were not staged um, film clips. I, I simply took an iPad one day a few weeks ago and went from classroom to classroom to give you a sense of what happens in those classrooms from our two-year-old students up through our children who are getting ready to transition to kindergarten next school year.
Welcome to visit our classrooms anytime at all. You didn't have to tell us they, were, they weren't <laughs> staged because you can't stage a two-year-old. No, just, that's right. <laughs> that's absolutely right. Yes. Questions, comments from board members? I ha have oh, a few more slides. <laughs> <laughs> I should have ended it with the children. I thought you were telling me to come visit your classrooms. So like, <laughs> my bad. Sorry. Um, one of the standards that we use to determine the efficacy of our Bright Beginnings program is a nationally normed tool called Teaching Strategies Gold. And this tool um, was normed on a very diverse and a large group of large group of children um, from birth to kindergarten. So it, it helps, it, and the, the norming group included children with and without disabilities. So we're looking at a nice broad group of children um, with, with a lot of different characteristics. In order for a child to have to be considered in the accomplished range, they have to be able to perform the skills independently and consistently. Children in that emerging range are children who are still requiring some help from an adult, either prompts or physical help from an adult. Um, so this data is takes a look at our children who were rising kindergarten students at the end of the past school year. So they were our children who were four years old moving into kindergarten this year. And Teaching Strategies Gold tells us about kindergarten benchmarks. Do these children have the knowledge and skills that they should have to be successful in kindergarten? So this, this um, tool gives us a nice look at the whole child. Um, so you can see from a very diverse group of children how well our children are doing when they're ready to leave preschool and move on to kindergarten. I'm going to drill down a little bit more. A second tool that we use is called the PALS PK. And the PALS is um, mandated in the state of Virginia for all four-year-old children who attend public school. And that acronym stands for Phonemic Awareness and Literacy Screening. I'm going to start you on the right-hand side. We'll go from the right to the left. The column on the far right is the range of scores that the state has said a child who's ready to go on to kindergarten should be scoring somewhere in this range at the end of their four-year-old year. So if you go to that middle column, the spring average score, that's the score where our bright, 
the average score for our bright beginning students in the spring just before they were ready to go to kindergarten. Um, two of those that I'd like to point out particularly, the lowercase alphabet recognition, the average score being an 18, which is above the range even um, that, that the state has, has put out there for us, and letter sounds is significantly higher than, than the expectation. Um, I think that has a lot to do with our teachers and speech therapists working together um, and that a program that we've put in place over the last couple of years. If you, if you work backwards now to that fall average score, in most cases that fall average score is just to give us a baseline for where children start. Our Bright Beginnings children start higher than most four-year-old students in Virginia. That really speaks to the strong instruction, I believe, that's happening with our two and three-year-old Bright Beginning students. These are some of the other subtests on the, on the PALS, and you, and you will see the same very strong outcomes for our Bright Beginning students. This is not something we can do alone. Um, we're really proud of our outcomes. They come as a result of a very talented staff, strong partnerships with families, and really strong working relationships with other community agencies and community support. Thank you for your time. Now you're done. <laughs> uh, any comments from board members? Yeah, I just, uh, I didn't realize that uh, it had grown that large, that so we had that many students in there. But I think the other thing is you really do a good job of uh, interacting with the other agencies, because that's, you know, that's really the way it's going to be successful, is when you work with those other agencies, and they, they'll give you referrals, and it's just, yeah, it's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you all this are you seeing um, there being kind of a continuing demand for this or a growing demand I understand from my visit to you that there's a wait list for some of these and if you could just speak about that so our community might be watching understands the need we, we typically do have a wait list um, we screen throughout this throughout the year and our staff does a comprehensive developmental screenings for about 450 students every year. Um, but we, we typically do, children who are identified in need of special education services must be placed um, so that they can receive those services. <coughs> so if they're identified for special ed services, we do not have a wait list. But for children who are identified at risk, we do have a waiting list. We place them in classrooms based on the priority. We look at those risk factors and typically children who are placed earlier are children who have multiple risk factors. Um, there, are, there are other children who, depending on the time of year that they're found eligible, we may not have place, places in a classroom. That's particularly true for that group of children who are three years old and fairly high risk. I have another question. Schools where they're in now, are those like centrally located? Or the, are all the kids bust, or I'm just cur curious about how that? Most of the children go back and forth to school on a bus. Um, some families choose to, to transport on their own, but most, most children do come on a, on a school bus, and that's, that's part of their daily routine, getting on the bus, and they love the big yellow school bus. Um, but several years ago, when the board asked for a strategic plan for our preschool program, um, we, we made very big efforts to make sure that there were preschool locations either within a school zone or adjacent to a school zone. So um, if, if a child is not able to attend in the zone where they live, um, they, there would be a, a zone adjacent to that where there would be preschool available. Do you, do you see a need to, to have them um, located at schools or, or does it seem to work the way it is now? 
It's working well the way it is now. However, we, we have been ex examining um, the benefits of um, potentially expanding to some additional sites. I'm assuming for transportation, are they on a separate bus from the, uh, it, they would have to be, right? If they yes, were, yes. Our preschoolers are transported um, on separate buses, uh, well, buses separate from K-12 students. Um, there's a driver and an aide on each of those buses. And um, there are car seats on the buses, so the little ones are transported in car seats. Um, car seats, and, and if they're four, they, they may be transported um, with a seat belt. I just wanted to echo again, this is probably one of the best examples of investing dollars early on. The data clearly shows that the students that go through Bright Beginnings are kindergarten ready. And so that's phenomenal and it's a feather in our cap. I don't know if the greater community realizes that, that our community has, has been able to collaborate, leverage resources for over 40 years and we do a really good job of preparing our youngsters for kindergarten. And so kudos to you and all that you've done. And our staff, it's a great team. Thank you. Ms. Cook. Zone B says a feather in the cap, I say a jewel in our crown. Um, <laughs> This is an amazing program, and it's nationally known. You, you mentioned the award in D.C., but um, you know the two things that I'm, are always front of mind for me regarding Bright Beginnings is, the, is the, if we're not meeting the, the need in our community, and that need is growing. Um, kids who are living at risk in this community, that as a raw number and as a percentage of our population, um, is growing each year. And so I would like to see this program grow to meet that need. Um, I also applaud the social supports um, and the work with families, and I, I, I often wonder what, you know, they go into kindergarten ready, the data is clear on that, but that some of those social supports, the, the, the home visiting, that doesn't follow the family um, at, at current, and, um, and I think that's in part what helps families um, be so successful in helping their children get a really great education. So anyway, um, congratulations and thanks for coming to share your work with us. Ms. Young. Yeah, I, I'm just, um, I, I, I'm very impressed with what you've shown us tonight, and I appreciate that. I do have a, a, a question about long-range success. Have, have there any, been any longitudinal studies as far as the benefits for long-range for these students? Um, we have looked at some of that, and, and we do have information that we've put together in past years looking at um, PAL scores and other things at the first and second grade level. We do, we do have some of that, and it, and it does show continuing benefits. What about third and fourth grade level? Have you gone that far yet? Um, we, ha we have not. Um, there are a lot of national studies that have. Um, we've, we've, encountered a l we've encountered some challenges in terms of um, identifying and following students through the, through the system. Um, but um, if, if you find that, I would, I, would, I would love to see it. Okay. If we're able to produce anything. Thank you. Mrs. Yeah. Young, probably with our new information, student information system, we're in a better position to actually tag students and recognize those who are moving through our system. So over time, we'll be able to uh, provide more data about the long-term effects of, of the program. Also, we'll be bringing to you at the budget retreat in January some possible ideas about uh, another site for our early childhood program for your consideration. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Other board members, uh, thank you, Ms. Dino. This uh, it's a great, great uh, program. Uh, you and your staff do an exceptional job, and this is the growing age is another sign of our growing community. And we have to see what we can do to meet that need. Uh, expanded facilities, and because we're starting to run out of classrooms as well at those elementary schools too. So, thank you for all you do. Well, thank you for your support of Bright Beginnings. Thank you. Uh, 7.05, Portrait of a Graduate, Class of 2016, Dr. Heron. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Um, this evening, annually, we bring you uh, some information about our Portrait of a Graduate, which provides data to the board as both a presentation and an infographic um, that you should have in front of you this evening. And to present this information tonight is Mr. Thorpe. Thank you, Mr. Thorpe. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Heron. Tonight we are going to present you information related to the class of 2016 uh, portrait of a graduate. 
As part of this overview, we will look at this graduating class's SAT and ACT results along with graduation rates, advanced placement information, and after graduation future plans. And during the course of the next few slides, we will refer to information on the screen as well as the infographic that is at your workstation. The class of 2016 had an on-time graduation rate of 91.5%. The on-time graduation rate is the percentage of students graduating in four years. You can see that our cohort completion rate is 93.9% and the cohort completion rate is essentially the on-time graduation rate plus any students who earned a GED or a certificate of completion. The dropout rate for this cohort was 4.3%. On the scholastic aptitude test, students can earn scale scores of between 200 and 800 on the reading and math batteries, and the writing portion of this test is both optional and scored separately. WJCC students' average score on the reading part of the SAT was 539. This is a slight increase from the previous class's mean and still outpacing the state and national averages. On the SAT math, WJCC students' average score was 543. Again, up from the previous class's mean in this area and greater than the state and national averages. Uh, God, that's all good, but didn't they change the SATs? And kind of we're back to 1,600. We're not, we're not doing 2,400 anymore. Um, so uh, again, the writing is optional and scored separately. Yes. Moving on to the American College test, uh, students who take the ACT are scored in four areas, English, math, reading, and science. The highest possible score in each of these subtests is 36. As you can see here and on the infographic, WJCC students average in each of these subtests were greater than both the Virginia State and national averages. The class of 2016's ACT scores were slightly better than those of the previous graduating class. All right, clarification about this. So the purple, Purple is, purple is the uh, graduating class of 2015. And then the green is the graduating class of 2016, but how do we know where we stand with Virginia versus, I, I'm, I'm assuming, I was looking for something to, sure. to be similar um, to the SAT. Absolutely, graphic. absolutely. If you look on your infographic um, up, up to the, uh, the top and the middle, um, our ICT scores are on the orange band, and then the Virginia mean is in the green, national is in the blue. College readiness benchmarks are established to determine the minimum score needed on the ACT, on an AT ACT subject area subtest, to indicate a 50% chance of obtaining a B or higher, or a 75% chance of obtaining a C or higher in corresponding credit-bearing college courses. The national benchmark ACT scores are 18 for English, math 22, reading 22, science and 23. And so this graphic shows the percentage of the graduating class that scored at or above these ACT subtest benchmarks. So for instance, 69% of the class of 2016's ACT test takers scored at or above the math benchmark of 22 points. The College Board's Advanced Placement, or AP program, offers high school students opportunities to complete college level courses and potentially earn college credit while still in high school. WJCC offers 31 advanced placement courses either through direct instruction or online through Virtual Virginia.
Colleges and universities will often consider students who score a three, four, or five on an AP exam for exemption from coursework with college credit granted for these courses prior to entering college or university. Scores on advanced placement exams may also be used by colleges and universities to consider student scholarship opportunities. Approximately 70% of all <coughs> WJCC AP exams earned a score of three, four, or five. This next slide refers to career and technical education, and I want to make it clear that the data that's on this slide is for all students who took CTE courses last year. So this is not just a, a cohort of uh, graduating class of 2016 information. 595 of our 1,081 students enrolled earned industry certifications. Participating students earned at least one of 36 certifications. The WJCC class of 2016 students were offered $18.9 million in scholarships. And in June of 2016, graduating seniors completed a survey about each of their plans after graduation. This graphic shows the class of 2016's plans. This is the presentation that we have for you. Are there any questions that we can answer tonight? Are we going to get copies of this? Uh, yes. Of the presentation? Yeah, I don't yeah. have this. I just have the one page. I just have yeah. The, the. Any other comments from board members? So I just wanted clarification. So we have annually a, around 100 students participating in New Horizons but we have approximately 600 students who are able to access industry certifications. That's, that's great. So can you explain that to me? Uh, I know that the data that we included included uh, both New Horizons, New Horizons and WJCC uh, uh, CTE classes. Um, if you have a more specific question, I can get that information to you. Does that include doing like, um no, I'm thinking of the CAD CAM classes that the students take. Is that included in this? Yes. That is one of the 36. And is there any way we can see kind of more of a breakdown of what makes up that number? And what the certifications are. Like, I would be curious to know what... And if, sure. and if there are differences between the three high schools, I would be curious to know that. Great. Um, I have the 36 here, but instead of listing them all, I can provide those to you along with the other information you requested. It would be interesting for me to see the breakdown by high schools as well, because... Um... Yes. Scott, do we know, if, like, for example, I'm looking at the employment numbers on that slide that I have in front of me. Do we know what jobs they got or if they actually have jobs? or why? I'm not sure what that means. What does that mean? I am not aware that the survey asks for the specific type of employment or the specific job, but, again, that's information that we can get to you. Oh, so that, that's a question. So where do you... So you're asking this from a survey, you're getting, can you explain how you get this data? Right, yep, again, just prior to graduation, in June of 2016, um, each of those students who was earning a diploma, uh, they were provided with a survey um, regarding their future plans, and this is the, the data that came out. Um, from, from the people who responded? That's correct. What was the response rate? Um, again, I'm sorry, I, I don't have that information, but I can I can get that to you. So really, it's it's self-reported. Said we're going to get a job. Yes. You don't actually know if they actually got a job or job is. I guess the other way to make that you know trying to make a connection here, I'm looking at the all the industri you know, industry certifications. I'm assuming they they acquired those before they graduated. 
know the ones who got that certification, they end up getting a job, you know, after they graduate? Not sure if we have any way of, of, of knowing that. Um, but again, the questions would, about the survey have, are I think it's important very because relevant. it would, um, it, it, it's useful to know if we have students that are going through those programs to get that certification, do they in fact, because everybody's all, you know, it's like you hear that all the time. Well, they're not qualified or they, you know, with the, these, these kids, uh, young people would be qualified if they've gone through, you know, these programs. Do they in fact get jobs? Um, Dr. Beers, I believe New Horizons does keep some records of the number of students that go into jobs directly associated with their But we also have students up here. Right. In fact, we have many more students up here that are going through these programs and then down. So I, that would be really, um, you know, pretty, the reason it would be critical is if those kids are getting jobs, it would be, it would be helpful for other students in terms of considering whether I want to get this or get that. It's like, hey, jobs. So I, I just, I don't know. And I, gosh, Scott, I don't know how you, you, know, you do that, but, um, but it's the same thing, you know, that the, the college, you know, do the same thing. You send out a, a survey, you finish your program, you're doing now, and um, gosh, it would be really, it would certainly speak to the, uh, well, that the readiness thing, the of the program. Workforce. Right, that whole workforce emphasis, if, if we can't show them, you know, if we can't show that that's, that's um, I'm sure, I know it's working, it's just the, it's the number. And I, I guess, so, Scott, so we graduate approximately 900 students each year. Uh, we actually had uh, 842 that were either earned a, uh, a diploma or a certificate of, of completion or a GED. So for me, what would be telling is the response rate, and so how many students didn't respond, and what happened to those students? We will get that information to you. That is valuable information. Yeah, and then just because maybe the community isn't looking at this, the broader community, just for me, again, what was telling was there are distinct differences between the three high schools in terms of students who are graduating with advanced diplomas versus standard diplomas and even SAT scores. But, um, so something for the broader community to, to understand that there are distinct differences. Definitely. I would be really interested in how and when the survey exactly, like how is the survey being asked? And for, for me, I, I look at if we've gotten 842 graduates have 450 of them going to a four-year college is that pretty are, right. is that we, we need can to we that. quantify that uh, um, going by going by that data that would sound close Miss Hummel but that's only if 842 responded yes I believe we have a very high response rate because the students are still in school and so they're self-reporting where they're going to go next and so we're, it's not, we don't know if this data proves completely true after they leave our system, but this is the last time we can actually get students to self-report what their plans are for the upcoming year. So we, we'll certainly find the response rate by high school, um, but I believe it is a fairly high response rate because the students are still right there and can actually take the survey. I mean, is it done like in a home room? Is it done, sort of, or is it, is it online? Is it online? probably different by high school on the administration, but we'll, we'll find out the details because I, we don't have those this evening. Because, yeah, I really think that, because I really think those certifications are, are absolutely crucial to, if we're really going to get serious about that whole work effort. Um, and I can't imagine near the end of those programs, you couldn't go in and, you know, and just, Near the end of the year, you know, the end of the end of their senior year. What are your job prospects? You, you, you know, you've, you finish up the mechanics program, or you you're going to be a um, lab tech or, or whatever. Are the jobs out there? Did you get a job? That sort of helps reinforce that whole. You know, I don't have to go to college. 
Usually, and I'll, you know, I would be, I think, a lot of the kids who go to college, they probably know less than what they want to actually do than the kids who are in the certification programs. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think uh, it's a little more self-selective in those programs. Thank you for that request for information. We will, we will get that. Any other comments? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Uh, 7.07, .07, school board self-evaluation. Dr. Beers? Okay. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I missed one. School no, start time, 7.06. Dr. Heron. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. At the request of the school board this evening, we are providing some preliminary information oh, yeah. on the impact of changing school start times. Um, this is not a new topic. It has been discussed by previous boards. Um, and Mr. Thorpe, there we go. And to provide some historical perspective, the, we're literally just outlining some of the times where we have information in, in previous uh, board agendas and board minutes regarding this particular topic. Um, we discussed it in 2007 in association with tiered transportation, how that would impact and actually voted on actual times, the tiers which we currently still operate. Um, we again discussed it in June. 2008, the impacts of reverting to a two-tier system and how that would impact start times, and um, again in July of 2008. And going through to the next slide, just again to give you some perspective, it became a subject again when we opened two new schools. Every time you open a school, it's a subject that tends to come into the forefront of our minds again. Um, there were, at that time, there was a lot of work from what I could understand in reading um, a lot of work done by staff and options presented to the board again. Um, July 2010, we actually decided to stick with what was done already. So brought lots of information, but then didn't make a change. The current board at that time chose not to make a change because of the complexity of, of this particular decision. Again in September, where there was some discussion about uh, research regarding teens and start times. In fact, we heard a student speaking about that this evening to us. And then again, March 2015, we had yet another discussion uh, on, from the dais about buses and school start times. Very important subject, but not a new subject, but one that we wanted to, to bring to you some information and then look for some guidance as to where to go with that this evening. Uh, Mr. Thorpe is going to present a couple of slides, just quick overviews of research around this topic, and then he's going to hand off to one or two other members of staff as well. Thank you. Good evening again. We have investigated recent research related to school start times, and regarding this research, we have a few talking points. Overall, a number of research studies support a shift to later school start times for middle school and high school students. Findings from the National Sleep Foundation show that teenagers need between eight and 10 hours of sleep. The typical adolescent's natural time to fall asleep may be 11 p.m. or even after. Uh, because of this change in their internal clocks, teens may feel awake at be bedtime even though they may be exhausted. This leads to sleep deprivation in many teens who have to wake up early for school. Um, also, a Hanover research article highlighted research findings that delayed school start times that, uh, that enables middle school and high school students to receive more sleep. Um, in addition, the article highlights a study associating later high school start times with lower accident rates for teens. And in a policy statement published in August of 2014, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends middle school and high schools um, to delay the start of class to 8.30 a.m. or later. Their findings show that early high school start times contribute to sleep deprivation among adolescents. And the recommended shift to later high school start times would align school sick schedules to the biological sleep rhythms of adolescents whose sleep-wake cycles begin to shift up to two hours later at the start of puberty. Ms. DePaula has information to share related to the potential impacts of shifting high school start times. Thank you, Mr. Thorpe. Any discussion of changing school start times, regardless of the level, requires careful consideration of the impact those changes would have on instruction, staff, and the community. 
Later start times for high school students would necessitate shifting the start time of middle or elementary students, either of which require examining the effect those changes would have on students, parents, and teachers in that group of schools. WJCC currently has a variety of shared programs located at Thomas Nelson Community College, New Horizons Regional Education Center, and the Governor's School for Science and Technology. Students attending these programs could, use, could be impacted by school start change. Morning programs at New Horizons and Governor's School currently run from 7 a.m. until 10.30, not including travel time to and from the programs. Students attending the morning session could start their school day prior to 7 a.m. and possibly end after 3.30. Although the number of itinerant teachers and staff that travel between our high schools and middle schools is limited number, a change in start time would also impact WJCC's current model of sharing personnel between levels. Besides looking at the impact of changing start times would have on instructional programs, we also would need to consider any effect a change would have on students, teachers, and the community. Many of our high school students have after-school jobs and family responsibilities. Several of them care for their younger siblings or participate in after-school programs for elementary schools. Changing school start times would impact the work schedule for these students as well as have an impact on their employers. The domino effect of any change could require parents in the community and teachers and staff with young children to make alternate arrangements for after-school care for elementary students. A change in high school start time would impact our students' athletes as well. With practice starting later in the afternoon, we would need to look at what effect this would have on scheduling shared James City County and Williamsburg facilities. Additionally, unless other schools against which we compete change their start times, students would miss instructional time due to scheduled away games and competitions. Finally, a change in high school start times would have implications for our operations department as well. In addition to investigating the impact of our transportation department and schedules, WJCC's cafeteria and custodial staff would also require adjustments in their work schedules at any level affected by a change. These are just some of the areas that would need further consideration prior to changing start times, regardless of the level shifted. Mrs. Bourgeois is here to now speak about student voice. Good evening. Recently, there was an opportunity to seek input from the high school representatives who serve on the Student Advisory Committee. There is a representative for each grade level from the three high schools, and as advisory committee to the board, these students provide insight and suggestions from their perspective on matters impacting school students. The committee held its first meeting of the year on November 9th, and the high school start times was a discussion item on the agenda. Students were grouped by grade level to brainstorm what they saw as the pros and cons of moving the high school start time to a later tier. The groups then shared their pros and cons. The responses were consistent across the groups, and much of it mirrors the considerations previously shared. We're going to start by looking at the pros. The student advisory members were knowledgeable about circadian rhythms and the natural time clock for high schools. They actually identified the exact time period of 11 p.m. to 8 a.m. as the body's natural time clock for sleep. So they knew their stuff. The members felt that having a later start time would provide students with more energy and the ability to be more productive in their early classes. They also identified benefits such as time to make and eat breakfast. They felt that there would be safer driving conditions in the morning because they're more alert. They also felt that it would re result in better health and overall better grades. They also identified cons to the consideration for moving to a later start time. There were examples as to how it might negatively impact after school activities and employment. Athletics was an area of concern regarding practice times and the challenge of darkness, as well as the impact on away events and the time students would be getting home after an event or the amount of time missed from class if they have to leave for an event before the school day is over. There would also be an effect on work schedules for local employers and students. 
They also voiced a concern regarding teacher availability to provide help and supervise clubs after school. They felt a number of their teachers are able to do so now because their younger children are still in school during that time, allowing the teachers to stay after school with them. They also felt that the change would make it harder for parents to coordinate child care for younger siblings, and they expressed safety concerns about younger students starting school earlier. The student members also shared how the time right after school is often used for homework, studying, and meeting assignment deadlines, some for online classes such as virtual Virginia. Finally, the students agreed that starting school later would just mean that most students would go to bed later in the evening, so they did not see, think that there would result in an increase in overall sleep time. So their discussion results. The discussion by the committee members was lively and focused. As an observer, I was impressed with their thoughtful discussion and reflection. During the discussion, it seemed that the group was going to be supportive of a change in start times. But by the end of the discussion, they were unanimous in their recommendation that high school start times remain on the current schedule. They stated that the advantage of getting out at 2.20 gives them time to get homework done, participate in extracurricular activities, and work if they so choose. This input is respectfully submitted by the Student Advisory Committee members to the school board. Um, that's all of the information we have this evening and really would ask the board about next steps to take. Um, obviously we have a lot of change coming up in the next year but we want to give you an opportunity to discuss and give us some sense of where you want us to go with, with this particular topic. Board member comments? Yeah. I'd like to know, all right, goes from doing this for quite a while now. Have you checked other school districts um, that are doing this? Because Arico actually, they only have a two-tier system. Um, and I'm sure that the, some of the same complaints were voiced by high school, middle school students as well. But um, they managed to do uh, that successfully. Alexandria, I, I'm sorry, Fairfax um, managed to, it took them ended up with a hybrid kind of so I don't simply because uh, um, I don't want to offend the students but um, I think the research is pretty substantial and I know it's a hard thing to do um, I know Fairfax County took three or four years to finally figure out the way to do it but they have done it and, and Rico does it. I have a grand. I have two granddaughters up there. The elementary student um, is uh, around seven, and the middle school student. No, I'm sorry. They're both in middle school now, so they're both at the same time up there. But uh, last year, yeah. So they um, uh, and the older one slept longer. Because they're middle school students. They're middle school. Schedule starts uh, um, later, so I, I, um, I for one, would like us to have still, you know, seriously consider this. I know about the three-tier system, about a two-tier system, and I know that transportation, the whole, I know it's a, you know, it's, if I think about it, it's mind-boggling. Districts have figured out how to do it. I hope we make an effort. I get, I'll be honest, it's probably the one area I get more calls and emails from uh, parents than anything that we've talked about it for 10 years. Studies and still want it. They still consider that a high priority. Ms. Anyway. Dr. Heron, to that point, so I guess it would be useful to have a cost breakdown of the two-tier versus the three-tier. Like, and, and maybe you're familiar, Fairfax County did just recently make that change, but that was a costly change. Um, I think that would be useful information. Um, and 
did just wanted to acknowledge the, the student who was here tonight and appreciate his passion, and certainly he had his facts. Um, and I think we as a board understand um, that the research does show that, that students uh, would benefit from a later start time, but then there's also the reality of that. And so it sounds like the students who were interviewed and participated in this, in this um, advisory committee meeting got that. Um, but it, would it be possible to survey all of our students so that all of our students could understand the process and get some buy-in? Like those 12 get it, so we have buy-in, but I think the other 20 students we have, maybe. And I believe everything's possible. We have looked at other systems. We, we really are looking for direction about um, whether it's the will of the entire board that we take this as an area to invest a lot of staff time in and bring you back a lot of information and whether it's the will of the board to actually pursue this to make a decision to go this route at this moment in time um, or is it something for later if, if it's something the board wants to pursue right now then we'll dedicate time and effort to bring a, a much more detailed information to you and maybe with even some options as to how we might go. I, I was at that meeting and the students were very animated. It was very, very productive um, and enlightening. Mature beyond their years, I certainly don't think I would have thought of that. All I would think about is, oh, I'll get more sleep. Uh, but they, they were thoughtful. And But I, because of knowing the research and knowing how important it is for our students to have adequate sleep to function well, I, I would like to pursue this. And I, um, I agree with Ms. Ownby. I'd like to know about the... Uh, the cost and the cost versus a one-tier system, a two-tier system, a three-tier system, and uh, because of the last school district that I worked in, they had a one-tier system. I think uh, all the kids came to school about the same time. I think the high school, middle school started maybe 15 to 20 minutes earlier, but they dismissed at the same time. And I'd be curious about that because, and I do understand that we would. I, I also think we would need to. Uh, survey the community and parents because uh, you know, I, I want, want my teenager to get home safely and, and be well. Ms. Cook? Um, I, I think uh, the research is clear and I'm in favor of having a school division that honors the health and wellness needs of its students. Um, asking them to arrive at school at a time that medical uh, professionals and research suggests is unhealthy for them is something that I just don't support. So I, I do want to uh, pursue this. I appreciate the feedback um, that, that we got, um, and, and I want to solicit more of it to ex and explore every option. But I really don't think now is the time. I think we should wait until we've got a new superintendent in place and have grappled with the beginnings of redistricting, since both of those things will have a big impact under, uh, on this topic and their huge undertaking. So I suggest we move forward with this, but we pick up the conversation again in March or April. I concur. I think that's what we need to do. Uh, I also agree with that, uh, particularly I would like to know the finances involved because uh, we're going to be dealing with some tough budget issues coming up uh, with the VRS and um, I think it's important for the community to know as much as we might be behind um, later start times, if it means that there's a trade-off on perhaps giving teachers raises or um, giving them some of their benefits or having to take benefits away in order to buy more buses. <clears throat> Those are the kind of discussions that we have to have. Comments, board members? Um, Fairfax, what time do their high schools start? <coughs> I think they only gained what? 20 or 30 20 minutes. minutes. I think there was a overall, after a long period of discussion and time, there was very little movement on time, but we can provide you a link to that information. Right. And they actually, they, um, they made an excellent presentation. It was, it was it SBA, last year. Yeah. Yeah. Right, NSP. The, SBA. Oh, the oh. superintendent was there. There were a couple of board members um, who initially, um, one really supported it and the other one. And they went through this, uh, a really good um, presentation, uh, weighing the pros and cons and getting the information. And it would be helpful, I think, just to um, talk to some of those people. 
mean, I kept the notes. I know what the problems were. Just like other problems. Yeah. Yeah. They pretty much look like the list that you had over there, <laughs> but they, um, they, you know, managed to figure out a way, and it, it wasn't a total. It was a. They, they ended up with more. It was more hybrid, um, and RICO has, as I understand it, they have a two-tier system. They have earlier, it's not outrageously early for elementary students, but it is earlier secondary students, six or seven through 12, start later. So it, it, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a waste of time to um, get some information from some of those. I move that we come back to this and Just thought I'd like, to, I'd like to make a couple comments first, if I could. Um, the uh, so Fa Fairfax would be interesting to know how much they do, how much they actually change their time. And also, you know, we we've, we've talked about a lot about high school later high school start times. That equals earlier elementary school start times. And so we we also need to make sure we we look at look at the elementary school parents and make sure they understand that this is this is also their kids. Moving to moving from where they are to to a newer time, and so we just we sure. need to make sure that, uh, that they're aware of the of the of the impacts to them. And uh, can I can I add? sure, Jim? Do you mind? No, I don't. Um, when I in in my neighborhood, when uh, buses from Matthew Whaley come in there, it's five o'clock, and I have I have parents who like the schools, their elementary schools to start earlier. So their kids get home. That's all. That's all I wanted to say. Okay. Um, so as far as where we go from here, um, got a lot of demands on staff time. What? What? Where can we go from here? What does? What does it mean? I think probably what we could bring first is a, a, maybe a, an outline of what we think uh, needs to be done to provide you the type of information you need to make a, a really good decision around around this topic. So we'll certainly we'll maybe do a timeline of what we could do and what that what that might include, whether it's a survey or something like that. I know we've just done a staff survey, we've just done a superintendent survey. Um, I'm not sure we want to do that. Right now in the community, they probably need a, a break from surveys before we launch another one if we're going to get some really good input on it. Um, maybe a first step for us is to engage more with the, with the systems that have actually gone through this and then develop some kind of a timeline for you and the types of information you would like to have. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think the budget number is also a pretty, a pretty important, important thing to do. To, to make sure we understand what those costs would be. Okay. There's probably a, a budget for changing start times on a three-tier three -tier system and changing start times on a two-tier system. Sure. So how much money we would need for, a, for additional buses to go to two tiers. And, um, and even the impact of money is going to be affected by redistricting. So if we were to do a study right now and bring you specific information, it's going to cost this to go to two tiers with our current situation. We don't know how redistricting may actually impact that as well. There's a lot of factors. I mean, maybe the will of the community and what their input would be maybe a first thing that doesn't, isn't impacted by redistricting. Right. So um, yeah, Mrs. Ellenbeer, Recommended that we hold off until April. Um, I guess that's yes, ma'am. When are we going to be? That going to be settled? Because I would think you you table this until after. Well, I think we're we're going to be looking at um, an RFP for redistricting early spring, um, and that process really won't begin until the fall. Or just until the fall. I'll be conclude 
early spring. Early spring to move into the next year, and only then will we really know what it takes to do a two-tier system because all of our routes will change or routes will change. Okay. So start thinking about it again in April. April, and then uh, I guess in April we kind of look at look at budgetary numbers for how much. I think the in the, in the baby steps of it. Kind of look at round numbers for three tiers versus two tiers, and what those start times might look like. Understanding it's just kind of notional discussions, but uh, does that does that work? Sure, yeah, we can bring it back information to have another piece of the discussion in April. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so moving on, 7.07, .07, school board self-evaluation. Dr. Beers? Uh, <laughs> I don't think we want to go over this item by item, <clears throat> but what I, um, um, I promised I would do this is I have, um, and I've reworked some of them, I pulled various items from various instruments and I've identified those here, and I, um, decided to go with um, six questions. It may be that um, there are 12 indicators for each one. That may be too many indicators. I don't know how much time you want to take filling something like this out. Um, but I tried to capture most of the major areas. The other thing, I went back to our um, SOP, the very first page. It identifies um, what our roles and responsibilities are. And although I did not identify each one of those individually, they are clearly covered by one or more of the items in each one of these. And I thought that was a, a, you know, a good, good place to start. Um, the only other thing, so really it's, and I, <laughs> I wrote at the top, feedback. It's, it's, that's really sort of where um, we are is I would say, we're not gonna look this over tonight, but I would say, look it over, see if it seems reasonable in terms of the general categories that, um, that I um, uh, came up with. I would envision uh, a form that uh, has a liquid scale attached to it, or as part of it, and um, going down each one of those um, indicators you know, you would indicate if you agree or disagree. Um, and I thought, because I, I, I heard this, um, that this was done by several other boards, um, in terms of pulling the information and, um, and also the comments, uh, is they had two board members do it. Um, collate the data, uh, come up with scores, that sort of thing, and then write out e each one of the comments that were, um, that were done. Uh, but I, it's, it's your evaluation, so it's just, this is just a, you know, a, a start at a, at a forum. We already decided that we, you know, we don't have to deal with this until January. Not gonna, far, uh, you know, that, uh, that far behind, and it will be after the 12 months. That's where I am, you know, it's like, I don't own this at all. Like doing or I actually thought myself when I was looking it over that uh, it is possible that um, there should be a B there, I'm sorry, there's not. A and B, how well has the board done its job and how well has the board conducted itself? There may be, you know, unnecessary overlap there. And maybe that, you know, that whole cat that could be just one category instead of two. But what you need to do, take it home, look it over. Because I know uh, you, you've only had a day or so to look at it. And uh, if you want me to keep working on this, give me feedback. I was looking for page numbers. Uh, Sorry? I was looking for page numbers. 
Uh, any comments from board members? Um, thank you, Dr. Beers, for your first stab at this. Um, I would just comment that when I was looking through this on under F, um, you would want all of your statements to be positive, right? I've so, tried. <laughs> uh, so on, because you're doing the Likert scale, so you want them all to be consistent. Right, right, right. So no, uh, under one, where it says, I've been in board meetings where subtleties of issues dealt with escaped the board, that's uh, a negative comment, so sure, I would just sure, change it. Sure. Um, I, I can, could, yeah, rephrase it to as possible. Exactly. It's yeah. just a matter of rephrasing it. And then for all of these, if you want, if you guys want to come up with, okay, whatever the questions are, I can easily put this in a yeah, Qualtrics yeah. survey. Yeah. I can do it in 10 minutes with a anonymous, you know, the, the link, email you guys. It gets all done, and then it spits out the report to everyone. Okay. And it's anonymous. So if you want if me you to, wanted, I'm yeah, totally, okay, so you, I do it all the time, so okay. that's easy, Great. I can do it. But that so would be my... So all you need is the instrument. I, I think my only uh, response to it is it's long. It's really long. <laughs> but maybe if it's just using a scale and we just have to... Right, that's the thing. If, if, if right. uh, The way this would be, uh, you'd have a kind of a matrix. So you'd have the yeah. Likert scale, and then off to the side. Off to the side. So all you're doing is reading and, and going. Yeah. And if you think 12 is too many, if you want to go to, I think you need to. 10 is is a is a nice number. Um, and the thing to do is look that over, look them over. If you can, um, if there's you know a, a couple there, that's what we need to do. Is just you know pare it down. Okay. So. That feedback you can send to me, and then once we, you know, once we finally agree on what we want to do. Do you have a timeline in mind? Well, we, uh, we had feedback? talked. I forget which meeting it was. We had talked that there, there, there was no time to do it in um, December, and I know we're really going to be busy in January. Um, I, I don't. I would not want the year to get so far away that we start to, you know. So I don't know. What, what do you think, Jim? Well, um, having only had a chance to look at this today, um, printed it out this morning because I, I guess it came yesterday afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need some time to to look at it. And what we really, I guess, the other issue too is um, for me is what is the purpose of the cell evaluation? Um, if you're doing evaluation of employees. You come up with a number and you kind of you rate that. Is it is it the imper is it What's the value of coming up with a number for most of, most of the ones that you know the ones that I looked at? It was um, basically to look at um, interaction between the board, the public, the superintendent, each other, and whether the board um, feels that it is accomplishing goals that it you know that it set out. It's more. It's more an educational thing. Right, it's exactly. It's the self-reflection. And, yeah. and so, uh, you, so the question is, do you really put a score to it, or do you just, is it something that's, that each member should think about and Well, I think, I think a score is helpful. Um, if, if, you're, if you're just to get a sense of um, where, we, where, we, where we seem to think we're strong or where we think we have some Right, um, and there's no stuff is copyrighted. Eh? None of the stuff is copyrighted. No, bo both of these at, at the bottom of each one of them said you are. This is a nonprofit organization. You are free to use, adapt, change, whatever you wish. Um, yeah, I'm fine with the numbers, but I w it would be helpful to not only have an average, but also the, to be able to uh, ferret out the degree of consensus. So if there's a wide. Oh yeah, you can do the standard deviations. You can do the oh, yeah. average means. With excellent. So I think we should come back and look and, and review this in our next meeting. Maybe not the third, the organization meeting, but the one after that, and just once again have a discussion about it. But meanwhile, if you do have a chance yep. to look it over and give you some feedback, I can just keep give playing us a, with it. Yeah. You want to give us a deadline? Okay. Um. How about New Year's Day? No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, when, after the, what's the next meeting after the organization? 17th. 
17th. That, that just don't give it to me on the 16th. <laughs> I knew we were going to. No, I knew we, we were going to talk about it. <coughs> okay. We Fair enough. Heavy, we had a heavy, so. Fair enough. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, action items 8.01. Can I get a motion for approval of the personnel actions as presented this evening? From anybody? I move to approve the personnel actions as presented. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Moved and seconded for approval of the personnel actions as presented. Mrs. Serza? Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Thank you. 8.02 fiscal year 2018 through 2027 capital improvement plan. Can I get a motion for approval of the fiscal year 2018 to 2027 capital improvement plan? Mr. Chair. Got to have a motion so I can discuss it. Yeah. Discuss this? No, you can move it and then and then it gets seconded, then we discuss it. I move we discuss it. Mr. Chair, I move approval of item 8.02 FY 2018-2027 Capital Improvement Plan. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Yes. Ms. Elby. So, um, just my only reticence in, in this, of course, is coming back to two, two items that were talked about um, at length regarding the walkway and the lights. So it's my understanding after a uh, meeting with uh, Coach Lynn, AD Athletic Director um, Lynn today at Lafayette, they, they still do not have the lights. So we removed lighting from the CIP, but the removable oh, portable is. lights are not there. He's, he's borrowing someone else's lights. I think the lights were actually several years out in the CIP, but we are planning to have the mobile lights by the end of this year. Okay, so by the end of this year, they'll have lights. Absolutely. We've actually been looking at some of the options and uh, the source for, of the funding as well. Okay, that's great. And then with regard to the walkway, just, just want to make sure that we don't let Lafayette down and that we will revisit busing. So we, we don't know if busing will work because we haven't had an opportunity to, to bus students because there was no need to do that with, with winter sports. Um, so we were, we're hoping to keep a, a very close eye on the busing schedules in, in the spring and assess and determine if it's working well and we'll, we'll bring you some feedback on, on that when it happens. And then just one additional question, because I know that there are community advocates and Lafayette advocates who are continuing to look at ways to build a walkway. Um, so if, if there is a plan that's presented to the school board um, that can be carried out economically by the community or by advocates, is that something that we would, the division would consider? Or because we've said, no, we can't use the walkway, are we never going to use that are we not going to allow students to go that way ever again? I think that would be a board decision, Mr. Chair. Well, I mean, if we if you can if we have a safe alternative that meets the needs and, and it's code and does all those does all those things, I mean, it's not consider it. I don't. I'm just one member of seven, but I mean, I don't think that we ever more if there's some some way. Hold, I don't know if we own the land, but I mean. It's I don't know that we're taking the walkway off the table forever. That's what I wanted to hear. So it's not off the table forever. And I know that we have reached out because one idea that, that Ms. Cook presented was, you know, partnering with Parks and Rec and reaching out to them. And it's my understanding we've, we've done that, but there hasn't been any real resolution with whether or not Parks and Rec would, would consider cost sharing or, or doing this. That's correct. I have to go through the county. Any other comments? I, I do agree with Ms. Mrs. Ownby that it's the worry or the concern that um, we have taken these two items out. And so there is kind of a trust that we will be doing right by the Lafayette High School athletes and that we, because they're trusting us, they're trusting us that they will get lights, they're trusting us that uh, we will make sure that uh, they're provided transportation. So I just want us to go on record as saying we're going to do right by them and that they can have trust in us. And I would hope that they can. Yeah, the same, I mean, the same spring sports that Lafayette practices at Warhill, Jamestown practices at Warhill, and the, and the buses 
when there is bus transportation provided for them to. But Lafayette didn't have bus transportation here to four, so, so that's where the trust factor comes in because we, we didn't, we walked. Lafayette walked. So we haven't had that experience, so we don't know if it's going to work. That's the trust factor. It works at Jamestown, it can work at Lafayette. So. Um, I, I believe we have had transportation before, Mr. Snipes. Yes, we provided transportation to Mr. Lynn and the any fall sports that want to go over to the Warrior Sports Complex whenever they asked um, at any point in time? I think uh, it was by request, and I think what we're moving towards is a more definite schedule based on the needs of the school. So we're not depending on that asking every time. But that obviously didn't work well. You're correct, Dr. Heron. The fall sports were practicing at Lafayette, so the only time they needed to use the sports complex is when it rained or they wanted to use those fields, so that's when they requested it. Mm -hmm. But we have been talking with Mr. Lynn about a more continuous, continuous schedule. Any other discussion? Um, I just wanted to reiterate uh, my statement from the last meeting that I do support adoption of this plan. Um, I appreciate the uh, division's work um, on it and the new processes that were implemented. Um, we've reviewed each item in this fiscal year 18 request and I believe that each one is justifiable. Um, we're operating in fiscally restrained times and I believe um, this document was developed with that in mind. Um, and I think this is a request to meet our very basic needs, so I support it. Any other comments from board members? Been moved and seconded for approval of the fiscal year 2018 2017 capital improvement plan. Mrs. Hurston. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Uh, that takes us to uh, 9.01. Board members' comments. Are there any comments from board members today? Mrs. Young? Um, Mr. Kelly, I would uh, like to defer my comments to the end of other members of the board comments, please. Okay. Ms. Ombi? I'll be brief. I just wanted to share that I had an opportunity with Ms. Cook to visit Stonehouse Elementary School and wanted to thank um, Principal White for that opportunity and was, was wowed by Stonehouse. I had not been there in many years and was particularly impressed with all the unique art, um, but was also impressed with, with Ms. White's knowledge of each of her students. Um, and I'm sure she is an example of, of all of our, our faculty and administrators. As each young student walked by, she knew them by name and recognized them and, and greeted them, and I thought that was, was phenomenal. Um, and just wanted to note, too, that I was amazed by the use of space at Stonehouse, which is one of our largest elementary schools and is um, it's more space. And so um, the, band, the band practices on the stage. They also do uh, use that space for OT and PT. And um, the library is used for multiple ways, for multiple things. Every inch of that space is utilized. Um, was impressed with that. And I wanted to thank our student for coming tonight, too to share his passion and um, appreciate students' involvement in the process. Ms. Taylor? Um, so I just wanted to comment on um, the very difficult topic tonight that many um, people came to speak about. Um, very emotional, very complex, um, dealing with Mrs. Young's um, family. Um, uh, regardless of my feelings or any other board member's feelings, um, the school board doesn't have the authority to ask Mrs. Young to resign. Um, and that decision lies with Mrs. Young and the Berkeley District. And uh, initially, like, again, I said it was very emotional. And, uh, you know, just looking in the media and not and just taking things at face value um, is, is, quite frankly, a mistake. Um, I know that firsthand. Um, local media said my husband's name is John. Side note, it is not. Um, so I think, again, you just have to take those things at face value. That's why I said we need more information, and I want to let Ms. Young speak for herself this evening. Um, I also uh, want to say that this has been a very sad, sad situation, and it's a no-win situation with uh, people feeling strongly um, 
uh, and, and kind of with valid reasons on either side, uh, but along with Mrs. Taylor, we have no jurisdiction over this decision. This is a decision that uh, has to be made by Mrs. Young and the Berkeley District. And uh, since, as a board member, I have no jurisdiction over this, and I have texted Mrs. Young and told her this, I am looking forward to fully working with capacity as school board representative until the time that uh, either of us are no longer serving on the board. But until that time, I will uh, work with her fully and engage as a school board member. Dr. Beers? Sure. Um, I believe this board is capable of being a, a great board. I would like to see us get beyond uh, what happened tonight, what we what's been uh, spoken about tonight, and start to look forward for the students and the staff, the school community. Ms. Cook? So I wanted to thank all the community members that participated in the public input process regarding the superintendent search. I know everybody's very busy, so taking that time is really important to us, and I, um, and I just want to personally thank everybody. I'd also like to thank the PTA Council for their reflection ceremony. Uh, this community is lucky to have uh, so many parents and children dedicated to the arts, and the artwork was incredible, and the kids were amazing. It was a great um, evening. I was, on Saturday, very proud to participate in the Sleigh Bell 5K. Um, over 700 people from the Williamsburg James City County community were there, despite the cold weather. Um, it was a great day, and um, it was a wonderful way to spend the Saturday morning. Um, if you've never done it, I strongly recommend it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good time. Um, and I hope everybody had a restful Thanksgiving holiday and a wonderful uh, holiday break. Uh, coming up. Um, I did want to make uh, comments about, um, about uh, the situation and the comments we heard in public um, forum today. Um, I, like Dr. Beers, am uh, anxious to move on for the sake of this community and for um, staff and most of all for students. But um, I feel uh, like, I like I would like to make a statement. And um, you know, uh, Mr. Kelly, last month I gave you permission to speak with Mrs. Young on my behalf. Um, when you, representing five members of this board, asked her to step down from this board, that must have been a very difficult conversation for both of you, and I appreciate your leadership, and I appreciate your dedication. Around the same time, I had the occasion to speak directly to Mrs. Young, and I conveyed to her directly my opinion that it's, I believe it's in the best interests of WJCC public schools for her to step down immediately. Because I took that position, I feel compl compelled to publicly explain it. I want to be very clear very clear that I do not hold Mrs. Young accountable for her husband's actions. Rather, I support asking Mrs. Young to step aside directly and specifically because of her behavior and her choices as a school board member. I believe she was negligent in her responsibilities to this division because when her private and public lives intersected, she did not take into account the negative impact her actions would have on the school division. Mrs. Young requested and received money from this division to subsidize her internet access at home. This is a benefit offered to school board members, but it is not automatic. Board members must request it, and it is of note that a minority of members of this board request and receive that public subsidy. But Mrs. Young did take action to receive public dollars to support internet access in her own. And I'm of the opinion, after speaking directly with Mrs. Young about this topic, that she requested this subsidy knowing that her husband had an addiction that had the capacity to exploit children and that it was possible for him to use the internet to perpetuate that addiction. One of the priorities of WJCC is to provide accountable and trusted leadership. Mrs. Young, by asking taxpayers to subsidize internet access in her home, given the circumstances, violated that priority in my opinion. Another priority of WJCC is to provide trust and authentic partnerships with families and the broader community. I believe Mrs. Young took actions that put that goal at risk as well. As school board members, we are frequently invited to school-related events as honored guests. Earlier this year, we were invited to the PTA Reflection Ceremony as members of the school board. The reflection event is one that is by invitation. Unlike, unlike artistic or athletic events for which any person can buy a ticket to attend this event, one must be invited. 
Mrs. Young conveyed this invitation to her husband, and on Thursday, January 6th of this year, she had him escort her to Hornsby Middle School to attend the reflection ceremony. Mr. and Mrs. Young took advantage of the reserved seats in the front row. Again, again, I am of the opinion after speaking with Mrs. Young about this topic, she knew that her husband had an addiction that had the capacity to exploit children. Yet she saw fit to use her position on the school board to bring him to an event that put him in close contact with our students. Mr. Chair, Mrs. Young, my vote was negligent in her responsibility to this division, which is why I gave you my support. I did not take that decision lightly. I had a keen focus on the facts and I confirmed them directly with Mrs. Young. Um, I would hope that I'm afforded the respect of my opinions and the conclusions that I draw as a result of them, as I respect everyone else's opinion on this that we heard tonight. And um, Mrs. Young, you are a duly elected of this member of this body, and I will treat you as such for as long as you're in that chair. Thank you. Mrs. Young. Um, I, I am going to make a, a statement tonight, but first of all, I just want to thank uh, Mrs. Carter. She holds something very dear to my heart also, which is Junior ROTC, which I do believe that is a program that our school should institute, uh, our school system, because I do believe it provides the opportunities for, for many students of all, uh, of all whatever, uh, to, to progress and to develop inner, um, inner qualities that I think help them throughout their lives, and so I do support that. I've supported that since I came on this board. Um, tonight I am going to make a brief, brief statement. Um, I, I do respect what, um, what Ms. Cook says. I am going to take issue with it, though. Uh, first of all, I've done nothing wrong. Uh, I've not been charged. I've cooperated fully with the FBI, um, the United States Attorney, and the Grand Jury. I am not complicit, nor do I condone my husband's actions. And as a mother and a retired teacher, I am appalled as you uh, by his deplorable and illegal behavior. I share the outrage. Um, I don't think anybody could be more outraged than my family is right now. I am, but I'm just going to give you a brief history. In 1992, my husband Chuck retired as a naval officer and was hired by a, a firm in Saudi Arabia. That is when we separated. It had nothing to do with child pornography. Uh, later that year, my mother-in-law, Anne, came to live with me while I completed my uh, second master's at ODU. In 1996, I was hired by the Department of Defense Schools, and my children, mother-in-law, and I moved to Korea. The next year, it became necessary for me to send my teenage son, Jared, uh, back to the United States to live with his father. And uh, you can imagine what that did to uh, us as a family, to have to remove one of my children. Uh, while living there, he observed pornography on his father's computer, but he did not confront him, nor did he tell me. In 2000, I was transferred to Germany, and from 1992 to 2010, I had no contact with my husband, other than brief discussions about our children and arranging visits with him. We worked on separate continents, and we lived very separate lives. Uh, my mother-in-law continued to live with me throughout that period of time. In 2010, my mother-in-law's health at age 85 declined and returned to the United States to receive advanced treatment, and she lived with my husband, her son. In 2012, I retired from Dodds at the end of the school year and returned in August to the United States. My husband asked for a reconciliation, and as a woman of faith, I prayed for guidance and wisdom in, uh, in my decision-making. I believed I was doing the right thing and agreed to reconcile, and I did not know anything about his addiction to pornography. At this time, we had been separated for 20 years from, 2000, from 1992 to 2012. And I think you can understand why I probably didn't know. Within a month of my return, my husband became very ill. He was diagnosed with diabetes, and his health deteriorated rapidly. He went from walking to using a cane, to a walker, to a wheelchair in just a matter of months. Um, it was probably two months. Um, he lost 70 pounds and was finally diagnosed with diabetic amyotrophy, and my mother-in-law's health continued to decline at this time. Their time and mine was filled with doctor's appointments, physical therapy, and hospital stays. Uh, Chuck began to regain his strength through physical therapy, but in July 2014, my mother-in-law died. 
In planning her funeral program, my daughter Bess discovered child pornography on, my, on Chuck's computer, but did not tell me. I have never seen Chuck viewing child pornography to this very minute. In 2015, I was asked to run for school board. I was elected in November and was sworn in on the 3rd of December. The week before Christmas, after my children informed me of what Bess had seen, we confronted their father about his addiction. My husband attended, has attended during this past year addiction recovery sessions. And then at the beginning of this year, my family began to look for inpatient treatment. Um, but we discovered they are available in Virginia only for convicted felons, and was something which I will discuss with uh, Delegate Bell. Uh, when my, not that I don't think they should be convicted, but when my son and one daughter recognized there could be no recourse for treatment, my son reported my husband's activity to the police. I just want to read a statement from my, my son. He sent her uh, something he would be happy to, to have me read, but I'll just read one part. And this is from my son, Jared. He said, this has been difficult for my family and incredibly difficult for me as I had to make the tough call to turn my father into the police. There have been times when I've reached extreme lows knowing where I have placed my father and forcing him to account for his illegal activities. It pains me to have had to hold my father to account, and doing it, excuse me, doing the right thing is something my mother has taught me. She taught, she didn't teach me how challenging and painful, painful that doing the right thing is. However, she did teach me that it's never the wrong thing to do the right thing. Uh, our house was searched, and only his devices were seized. Uh, my devices were not touched by the police, although I would have been happy to give them to him. Um, they declined. He, he was arrested on November 17th. Um, excuse me. Oh, it was not until Chuck's hearing on November 22nd that my children and I knew the depth and seriousness of my husband's addiction. Not that we think that even one picture is right. At hearing, the extent of it was like being punched repeatedly in the face, and my children will testify to you that they, whatever we thought, we had no idea. Uh, currently, he is in jail, and he will remain incarcerated for uh, until his trial uh, in, in February. Now, there's four concerns, one of which... Um, this is um, Cook alluded to. Uh, my husband did attend a few school events under my supervision, but only events to which the public had been invited. I did not realize that the, thank you. If I had known now, if I had known then what I know now, to be honest, I don't know what I would have done. But I do not believe that I would have taken him. Like some other board members, I do receive a small stipend. And I can tell you, I spend many, many hours preparing for these meetings um, in our home. But our home has had internet connectivity for many years. Um, number three, my school electronic devices are password protected. And my hus husband has had no access to them, but I will ask that the school board uh, take especially the computer and make sure. Uh, number four, regarding my tenure on this board, uh, there have been concerns that I will be too distracted to serve and advise in the superintendent search. I quote Peggy Bellows from the Virginia Gazette. She's the editor. Uh, quote, she has been engaged and an enthusiastic member of the school board and that's just what the community needs to get through this next few years, unquote. I will continue to be engaged. But during the preceding weeks, there has been sensational and hysterical publicity and innuendo and about my husband's issues. I want to thank Dr. Beers uh, for his circumspect and rational position. He has demonstrated the leadership 
and the steady hand that this board so desperately needs. I've done nothing wrong, um, and I will continue to serve this board with, uh, with honor and uh, with the dignity I think it deserves. I, I will not resign. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Young, um, I, I, uh, I can't even imagine what, uh, what you and your family are going through in, in this difficult time. Uh, we come uh, to the end of a long meeting, at the end of a long day, a long month, which could be uh, also really at the end of a long year. Uh, when I reflect over the past month, um, you look at all of the, all of the uh, events and activities we have um, in my seven year tenure on the board, I had one of my, I would say, in my, certainly in my top five great moments uh, as I helped a student get into college um, who had, been, had some discipline issues with us um, and achieved their dream of getting into school. That was uh, a very, very happy moment for me. We had the reflections, the PTA Council reflection ceremony. I was able to go to the Lafayette State semifinal football game. Fortunately, they were not successful, but the team fought hard to the end and can be very proud of what they accomplished this year. Um, I attended Peter in the Star Catcher at Jamestown High School, an exceptional play. Um, just, those students did a great job. Um, since we were here last, we've been to the Virginia School Board Association Conference. Uh, we've had superintendent search events um, with the community forums and the, and the the search team coming to uh, meeting with several members of our community. Um, and last week I was able to go to a, a, a career and technical forum at Thomas Nelson Store Triangle Campus uh, with, where they are looking to, to uh, move some uh, CTE offerings up into the historic triangle which our students can take advantage of. Um, so it's uh, Certainly has been a lot going on this year, this month, and a lot, uh, a lot of um, different emotions all all across the board. Um, you know, in the past month, I've been accused of going too fast. I've been accused of going too slow. Um, rarely do you come across where there's full agreement as the actions and direction to be taken, especially in a situation as difficult as this one with which there is no playbook. Um, I have done what I think is the best thing that I, that I thought was to be done. Um, I've, done. I've done what I thought was the right thing to do. Um, throughout, this, throughout this past year, um, that's the way I approached the leadership of the school board. Um, there might be a couple of things which I wish I had done differently, um, but, but at the end of the day, I have no regrets. I've done the best that I can um, and the best that I know how. So, uh, with that, our next meeting is January 3rd, 6 o'clock at City Council here in the Stryker Center for our organizational meeting. Mrs. Serza, I think we know uh, what our, our agenda is going to be for that meeting. And uh, for the last time, we're adjourned. <laughs>